uh, intro about what LifePeer is. Um, LifePeer is building the video streaming layer of Web3. Uh, we've been building this project for the past five years. Uh, we've, been, we've gone through many iterations. Uh, currently, uh, the, the network processes about two and a half to three million minutes of video per week. Um, and we, we, you know, those videos are, are viewed by then many million uh, number of users. Um, so so a, just a quick overview about video technology, right? So um, video is about 82% of all the data in the world today, uh, all 82% of all the data on the internet. Um, needless to say, that's the majority of the content that we consume on a daily basis. Uh, and that's why LifePeer is excited to be working on this technology and to decentralize uh, the infrastructure. Um, so, so when we talk about video infrastructure and video streaming technology, uh, like, what, like what is it, how is it, how is it done, right? It, there's really three steps. There is kind of the ingest and upload step. There is the video playback step. Uh, and then there's the video processing step. Right, we're going to go into each of those steps just quickly so that we can set the right context. Um, so here it's a um, kind of a typical architecture of a, of a video application of today. Right, where um, it looks a little complex. I'll, I'll go through each of the steps so it doesn't look so complex anymore. Um, the first step we talk about video ingest and upload. Right, so this is really dependent on if you're building a video on demand application, so something like a YouTube, uh, where you upload a file and have it streamable by anyone on the web, or if you're building a live streaming application, which is something more like a, a Twitch or a Facebook Live, right, where people are watching you in the moment uh, as things are happening. So for live streaming, it's about ingesting a live stream, broadcasting it, uh, and for video on demand, it's about uploading a file into a backend. Uh, and, and on the receiving end, um, usually there is a media server that's receiving the content, right? It speaks the language of the video protocol, uh, speaks the language for also HTTP if you want to upload it. Um, and, and there's many different types of ingest tools that you can use, right? So oftentimes we think of, especially for live streams, we think about um, you, can I, you can either have a desktop-based broadcasting software, something like an OBS studio, which is really popular amongst uh, Twitch streamers. Uh, you can have a mobile app that, that's broadcasting the video, uh, broadcasting the live stream using the camera on the mobile phone. Or you can have an in-browser uh, broadcasting uh, studio that's only recently starting to get popular. Uh, and and you, know, you might have heard of uh, like a restream or, um, or things like that. Um, so, but those are just end user tools, right? If you're a developer and you're building an application, um, there are a, couple, a few SDKs that can help you to build those types of experiences. Uh, so for example, there are, there's a React Native component um, called Node Media Client that allows you to build a mobile broadcasting uh, experience. And then um, we've actually built a, a tool called Web R WebRTMP that allows you to build a in-browser broadcasting experience that can you know, capture the webcam on the, um, on the, um, on the laptop. Right? Um, so, so that's a little bit about ingest. The ingest is all about you know, putting the video into, into the backhand. Right? And, and now, the video is in the backhand. Um, how do you play that? Right? So, so here is delivery and playback. Video delivery is oftentimes delivered through a content delivery network, or shorthand CDN. Uh, and this is because oftentimes there's you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of people watching the same content. In the case of a live stream, you know, if you're watching um, the World Cup or something, there's millions of people around the world, world watching the same stream. Right? So in that case, you really need a really scalable uh, infrastructure to be able to deliver that kind of content. And a content delivery network helps you do that. Um, or you can, if, you, uh, if you don't have that many viewers, sometimes you can deliver directly from a media server, uh, and that's also possible. But when you're delivering it, you're delivering it to a video player on the client, right? So the video player can be you know, either on the mobile phone or it could be in, in a browser. Uh, and, and in terms of delivery and playback, uh, we think of 
HLS, which is the video streaming standard uh, uh, defined by Apple. Um, there is adaptive bitrate streaming, which we're going to go into later, and then there's the video player. Right. So let's first take a look at HLS. Like, what is HLS? Like, why um, why is this thing interesting? Well, HLS is the file that you give to the video player in order for it to play, right? So the HLS, uh, HLS represents the video itself. Uh, and the, the, um, the format of HLS is, you know, there's a playlist that uh, describes kind of all the different small media segments. And then there's the, there's the media segments themselves, right? Which is, you know, the video cut up into small chunks. And then the, the video player simply loads each of those chunks uh, in a sequenced way, and then they re they're able to play it back um, in, in real time, or sometimes if you two exit, you know, it'll play it faster than real time. Right? So that's really HLS. Uh, so when you're thinking about a video stream, it's actually tiny little files that are that are making up this big stream. Um, so that leads us to the second topic, which is adaptive bitrate streaming, and this is the secret sauce for how video is able to play on the internet in the first place. Right? Because if you think about this problem, we're streaming video under all kinds of different networking connections from around the world on different types of devices, different sizes of screens, right? There's so many different varieties, but yet everybody expects to be able to watch the video just the same, right? So in order to do that, um, what we do is we transcode the video into many different versions and many different bit rates uh, so that, you know, if I'm sitting at home watching a video on my smart TV, I can watch like a really high resolution version of the video. Or if I take out my smartphone and start watching the same video, it's going to be like a shrunken down and lower resolution video, right? And, and when I'm loading that smaller video, I can, tr I can load the smaller bit rate video. Um, and adaptive bitrate streaming is saying that when, as you're streaming the video, you can actually change the version and the resolution of the video that you're watching without a broken experience. So for example, if you're ever sitting at home and you, um, you watch Netflix and it starts out really grainy and then it, it gets crisper over time, that is adaptive bitrate streaming in, at play, right? So the smaller version comes on at, the first, at first because um, your networking is just kicking in, and then as the video plays, uh, the player realizes, oh, you actually have a much higher uh, network throughput, and it starts loading the higher resolution version. And this is very crucial for video streaming to work correctly online. Um, and we t when we talk about video players, right, it's really a piece, um, you know, a piece of software that you can put in your you know, in your um, web application, or you can put in your mobile app uh, in order to play that um, HLS video that I just talked about. Uh, now there there are many different uh, many different SDKs or uh, or products that you can use, right? There's open open source video players or closed source or proprietary. Um, video players. Here I'm just um, kind of sharing a few of them. The most popular open source one is probably um, video.js. Okay, so that is kind of an overview of playback. Now let's talk about video processing. Right? Video processing um, is something that happens behind the ba uh, in the background that most people don't know, uh, but it's actually a super, super important step. Right? We talk about that transcoding step, and that's how we're able to enable that um, adaptive bitrate streaming way of streaming video. Right? So usually when the video it gets uploaded or ingested into the media server, it gets sent to a transcoding engine uh, that then transcodes the video and then puts it into a CDN or stores it into an object storage. The thing about transcoding is that it is super computationally intense. Because right? you can imagine videos are very uh, complex data structures and you have to kind of decode the video, understand what it is, re-encode the video into different versions, store them somewhere, and that's really that's really expensive process. Um, so transcoding, you know, work the workflow looks something like this, right? Where you have that transcoding engine, you can, for example, ingest like a 1080p version of video, and you can transcode it down into a 720p and 480p and 360p and 240p, and they're all appropriate for different device devices and different different networking conditions. Right. 
Um, so that's a little bit o overview of video streaming, right? So all of those pieces together um, makes video streaming work on the internet. So now that's, that's pretty complex. Uh, for anybody here this weekend trying to build a hack, you probably don't want to think about all of those things and put all those things together. That's, that's way too much work. Um, so at LivePure, uh, we built a decentralized solution to make, to make all of those complexities go away and to make it really affordable. So how do we do that? Um, LivePeer at the core is a set of protocols. Um, it's a protocol that allows people to contribute resources onto a network that then they can also get paid for contributing that resources. The set of the, uh, and, and it's encoded as a set of smart contracts in Solidity. Uh, it's deployed on Arbitrum. Uh, it was first on, on Ethereum. Recently, we migrated to Arbitrum. Um, and, and it acts in a few ways. And one of the most important things that it does is that it acts as a global registry of these orchestrators that represent kind of transcoding capacity around the world. So if I am a broadcaster or if I have a video that I need to transcode, I can talk to this global registry and say, hey, tell me a list of people who have capacity that can do this work for me. And through this dis discovery protocol, I can not only get a list, I can also kind of start testing, oh, who's, who's closer to me, right? Who has a good latency um, with me, has good connection with me. And I can start sending my video to them uh, and they can start transcoding that for me. And of course, the protocol also handles micropayment um, and all these things, so the value transfer also happens, and the orchestrators are incentivized to do that transcoding work. Right? Um, and the other thing that the, the network does is that it's highly redundant, uh, and what that means is you know, there's lots of orchestrators around the world, and there's, lots, there's always an overabundant amount of transcoding capacity on the network, so that you know, if one orchestrator all of a sudden goes offline, so for example, um, you know, I'm running, I'm running an orchestrator in a data center, and the data center loses power, and everything goes offline, and that's totally fine, because uh, the, the, the software is resilient enough that it'll just immediately fail over to another orchestrator, and it'll continue to work, right? So even for a, a video live stream, uh, it won't disrupt the, the experience. And the other thing that you can do is you can Double up, you can, use, you can use multiple orchestrators at the same time so that you know, if one goes away, it doesn't even matter. In fact, you can just have the two race, right? And whoever gets back to you first, you use that one. Um, under the hood, if you look at the live here protocol, I'm not gonna go into this whole complex um, graph, right? I, I'm ju I just wanna show this graph in that um, you know, there's a smart contract, right? We have the broadcasters and the orchestrators, uh, and there's a verification process here to make sure when the broadcasters are working with the orchestrators, um, they don't need to inherently trust each other. They, you can just say, I'm sending my video into the network, and I can trust that the network will verify the work for me, and, and, and I will always get the right results back. And if I don't get the right results back, there is heavy economical penalty uh, so that it's highly disincentivized for someone to cheat. Very similar to kind of the blockchain design concept, proof of stake concept, right? If a validator cheats, then they get heavily slashed. Therefore, they don't, uh, you don't want to cheat. Another important concept here is that there's an on-chain portion and an off-chain portion. Uh, so, and of course, uh, when we talk about video streaming, there's gonna be millions of video streams that are happening on the network, right? We can't be writing transactions for every single one of those streams. Uh, so all of the video streaming steps within the live peer networks happen in an off-chain way. And the only thing that happen on the blockchain are the registrations of the nodes, which happens only once in the node's whole lifetime, uh, and the payments, which can be batched together and happen asynchronously. Okay, so you know, here I'm, I'm just gonna go into a little bit of the token economics. Um, the, way, the way it works is that um, people stake their live peer tokens to the orchestrators, and as the live peer tokens get staked to the orchestrators, uh, the orchestrators can earn live peer rewards. And at the same time, the people who want to transcode um, their video with the vid uh, with the network also paying in, um, also paying in uh, in ether to transcode the video. So as 
more demand goes on the network, more um, the, the more valuable the network becomes because essentially the live peer token represents um, the, um, the amount of revenue that you can capture for all the revenue that's going through the network, right? And, the, and then it kicks off this uh, flywheel where the more, um, the more demand on the network there is, the more valuable there it becomes, then it, it attracts more supply, and then uh, that, that kind of wheel starts, uh, starts going. So that's it. Um, that's it. So a little bit about the intro of Live Peer, a little intro about um, video streaming. Now Victor is going to show you some exciting demos around, um, uh, around video on demand streaming and also around live streaming. Hello. Let me set this up. Hello. Right, so uh, I want to show you the capabilities that we have in our, in our service, in our API. And we're going to start with the live streams. So we have this dashboard page here with the streams you have in, a, in your account. I'm already, I have already registered. I'm logged in here. And you can create a stream from here. But you would normally be doing this from uh, your application. So you, you, we have an API that you can use. And you get an API key, and then you can create all the objects on demand as your application logic requires. And we can start here. Let me increase this. So we can start here by, by creating a new stream, and you give it a name. I'm setting it to record as well. And here we have a fully created object, and it has the configured renditions that you want for your, for your playback. So it controls how this, this stream is going to be transcoded. And then here are the important bits right now, which is the stream key and the playback ID. The stream key is the secret that you give to the, to the user that is doing the streaming. And it's going to give them right access to this stream, to this channel. And you also have the playback ID, which is the one you use for playback in the stream. And it's more, a little more public in that sense, that many people will be watching, but only one will be writing. And here is the stream that we've just created. And say, this is an example application that can do video, the live streaming from the browser using the SDK that we showed. And all you need to do is to copy that stream key here. So if you say your application creates the stream, and then it's going to send this key to your application somehow, and it's gonna, it can start streaming to that channel. And then if we see here in the dashboard, the stream should now become active. Or maybe not. Yeah, it did. So it's still loading, starting the, the transcoding and everything. And while it does that, I can also show the playback application. So this is just another example that has a video, video JS player. And all we need to do here is create this URL, which is the playback URL. You can also copy it from the dashboard. So here is the playback URL. And the sa in the same way, you're in, your, in a real application, you would actually get this specific playback ID from your server, from your backend, and then you inject in the front end, and you can see the stream as it is happening. And there's just a little delay of the actual transcoding of the stream, but it's live coming fr from this web page here. Let me close this. And this was using this WebRTMP SDK that we showed, which is made to, for you to stream directly from the browser. And it's good to do quick demonstrations or, or start getting started with the LivePeer platform. Right. So the other thing I can show you is the VOD API. And 
So we have here this other tab in the dashboard. It's not the streams, it's actually assets. And it's where you can see all the files that you have uploaded to the API. And the same way, you can create an asset here by giving a URL to import, etc. But I can also show that via the API here as well. So the process there is actually in done in two requests instead of one. And first, you request for an upload URL that you're, you're then going to use to actually upload the file. And this URL here can be called from anywhere. So the idea is that you create this, this pre-signed URL on the back end, give it to the front end application, and the user can do the upload directly. So you don't need to do any kind of proxying of the actual file. Then to use that URL, you just do a put with the file as the, as the body. And here, it's already going. And when you import a task, uh, an asset, you get a task that processes the asset until it's, it has all the metadata and like the duration of the video, bitrate, all this, this kind of stuff. And you can also call this other API here to list all the assets in the account. You can also read individually, but this is easier for now. And here's the asset we just uploaded and all the specs that we parsed. And it also has a, a playback ID, uh, but let me show it in the dashboard. So here it just showed up, the one we just uploaded, and it has a download URL here, which is actually how you can play back the, the file. So this is just playing uh, an MP4 right now, and we were, are working on adding HLS support for assets as well. But as soon as you upload the file to LiveBeer, you can already use it from this, your, this download URL. And here you can see that this one also showed up. It actually came from the recording of that stream, the, the first part of the demo. And it's also, it, the recording also becomes an asset later, and you can use it the same way and play back the, the recorded stream as a, as a video file or export it or even create an NFT out of it. And so let's go into that NFT part exactly. We have this SDK, the video NFT SDK, that, is build, that builds on top of this VOD API and you can use to easily create video NFTs. So it handles both the uploading of the file, the processing in, in, in the live peer network in case, it, in case it's necessary, and the export into APFS and then the actual minting of the NFT from the exported file. It can be used to build any kind of application. You can use it from the front end, from the back end, from a CLI, and we actually have a couple of examples using that. And I'm going to show this one, which is just a, an application on the front end. And if you are logged in the dashboard, you can go to just Mint NFT, and you're going to see this, this UI here. And let's use the same video file. And this is just the smart contract that we have deployed by default, but you can also use a custom ERC721 that you, that you have. And first step. So it's doing the, similar, so the same process that I just showed in, on Postman. To the, it re requested the upload URL, then actually sent the file, then it did some processing, and I'm going to explain soon. And then I already exported to IPFS, and it has this hash here, this CID. And it's already injected here, and now we can actually mint with that CID. And this, this export in here, currently, it's like, we, if you're using OpenSea, there is a file limit of 100 megabytes. So if, it's, if the file is higher than that, it's not going to show anything. It's not going to show the preview of the file. And, but when you do it through the SDK, it's going to check that, and it can transcode the file to a lower quality, just so it, so it shows on OpenSea. And it's not just a, a blank NFT over there. And here we can see that it finished. Yeah, so it's already available here 
on OpenSea. And I did it on testnet, but it works on mainnet just fine. And yeah, back to the processing. The, the, we also intend to add support of, to other kinds of things, like if you upload a video that has a codec not supported on the internet, on the web, on most browsers, we can also offer to, to change that. So we, that's exactly where we plan on adding more and more functionality with the power of the live peer network. And we can also go through the smart contract if there's time. The, so just to go, go through quickly here, I mentioned that you, were, you would be using just the default contract here, but you can actually create your own and just change the address here so the, the SDK calls that, that separate contract. And you can do so following this guide here that is in the, also in the documentation of the SDK. And we have like the base code here for the contract and it's really simple just uh, inheriting from an open Zeppelin contract and then adding a, a simple logic on the mint that I can show here, like we, not gonna show here is better. We just import the, the contracts from the open Zeppelin, then have our, our custom one inheriting from it, one that has the storage for, for the NFTs. And then these counters just keeps track of the IDs of the minted NFTs to always create a new one uh, with a different ID. And then we have this event here, which is sent after the mint is done and is what the SDK relies on to show what was the, the minted NFT, the minted ID of the, the NFT. And then this is the main mint function. The SDK also relies on a, on a signature like this. And then it basically creates the new token ID, mints it with, for, the, for the respective owner, and sets the URI to what is sent on the request here. And that comes from that thing we saw here. This is the token URI that went on that argument. And then that's it. It emits an event with, which we can use in the front end to show any information about the, the newly minted NFT. All the, and finally, all the other uh, methods from ERC721 are already present in this contract just because it inherits from this. So it, it supports any tool that relies on, on these interfaces, like OpenSea itself. So that's how it just shows up there uh, as we mint it. And I think that's it for the demo. All right. Thank you, Victor. Um, I want to spend just uh, a, f a few more minutes uh, talking about prices and ideas that you can uh, think about building for the hackathons today. LivePeer is um, offering up sixteen thousand dollars of total prizes. Um, I'm really excited to be to be here and, and working with the hackers here. Um, the first prize is for six thousand dollars, and we're looking for uh, developers to build the killer video-centric social media creator or gaming Web3 application. Uh, this is an area that I think is ripe for disruption for Web3. All of the components uh, from an infrastructure perspectives are here for us to create a Web3-centric social media platform that can be, comp uh, that can be very competitive to today's uh, platforms like a YouTube or, or, or a TikTok. Right, so uh, we're really looking forward to uh, to seeing the creativity of of hackers here building building platforms like this. Uh, the second uh, the second prize is for four thousand dollars, and that's for the best use of the live peer video NFT minting SDK that we just that we just showed. Um, we look forward to to seeing how people can creatively use this asset of video NFTs to do all kinds of interesting things, right? And think about, um, you know, kind of thinking beyond the kind of the speculative use cases. I think there's a lot of really interesting, uh, interesting areas that this can go to. The third prize is for the best video on demand application using LivePeer. Uh, so simple, think about this as the Web3 YouTube, right? Um, how would a YouTube look different uh, if it's built in a Web3 native way? What kind of features uh, would it have? What kind of value proposition would it have for creators? 
uh, to be able to connect directly with their fans, to be able to directly monetize the work that they do. Uh, I think there's a lot of really interesting uh, ideas in here. Uh, and finally, uh, fourth place, um, fourth price uh, for $2,000, uh, we have the best applications of live peer in the metaverse. Right? The metaverse can be interpreted in different ways. Um, I kind of think about the metaverse as um, this just already deployed and already running decentralized infrastructure in general, uh, instead of, I think, the more narrow definition would be kind of like a rendered 3D world, right? Uh, so thinking about using video streaming, both video on demand and live streaming into the metaverse or from the metaverse to show uh, kind of people not participating what's going on in there. Uh, I think there's a lot of interesting use cases there as well. So that's it. Um, we, I think, have a couple minutes left. Uh, if we have any questions from the audience, um, we're happy to, happy to hear that right now. I have a quick question on the, um, so when you showed the live video, so the stream that you just created during the demo, so it was also uploaded as an asset. Um, the asset that is displayed there, is it only one of the encodings that's there, or is that also like in the different uh, formats, like the different uh, kilobit streams and so forth? So, so the asset that is created automatically is with the, from the source, video so it, it's just the highest quality version but when we also do have a recording that is the same hls that was made during the live stream so it has all the transcoded renditions and you can actually download those as mp4s as well but by default we, we create only the source any other questions from the audience all right Thank you both for the overview and the demo. Uh, given that you're thinking about video all the time, but building it from an infrastructure perspective, if you had the time uh, to, to work on a hack, or what are some ideas that you would love just a spare extra 20 hours to work on using Lightbeer? Maybe we can do, we can search over. Yeah, so something that would be really cool would be a mobile app using the the NFT SDK, and then you could just make a video and immediately make it into an NFT really, really easily. On on could be just like a camera phone that become that creates NFTs out of every video that you create or something like that. And I don't know, could be also a more a more different video NFT so that you can create different interactions with video NFTs. Like you can maybe split your NFT in two. Each one is one part of the video. Then you gift it to someone else and then you can merge them together if you have the continuous parts or I don't know, some crazy stuff like, like that that would be really cool to see. Um. Yeah, there's so many, so many interesting things that people can work on. Uh, I have a couple of ideas. Um, there's been a hundred application, over a hundred applications built just in Q1 alone on, in LivePeer. Um, some of the things that are in really interesting, uh, for example, um, the video streaming application for uh, DevConnect is actually built using LivePeer and is streamed with LivePeer. Uh, it's called, I think, StreamETH.TV. Um, one of the thing, one of the interesting things is it was a collaboration with between LivePeer and Ethereum, uh, the Ethereum Foundation. One of the interesting things that that we did is not only is it now completely open source, anyone can take that website and just change, make improvements on top of it. Um, for example, adding like a chat function or adding the login function, so people uh, logging with Ethereum, so people can see, you know, your your ENS, right? Things like that. Um, but it's also componentized, uh, like modularized, so that, uh, for example, the video player that's being used in its, um, is actually a module. Um, and this video player has some interesting functionalities. One is that um, you're able to have, automatically have a primary and a backup stream, so that um, you know, when you're streaming an event, 
um, you can have two streams going on. In case the primary stream fails, uh, it automatically switches to the second stream, and your user doesn't feel uh, doesn't see any um, doesn't, doesn't see any breakage in the experience. But there's so much more that you can add in this video player, right? Just think about what a Web3 native video player is, can look like and what kind of functionality that it can have, right? If you can start tracking, uh, you, can, you can start allowing the viewers to log in with their MetaMask and show uh, the NFTs that they have in their wallet and the NFTs can then, that information can be sent to the broadcaster, uh, so the streamer themselves, so the streamers can know the type of people who are watching their streams, right? Um, and this is kind of like an idea off the top of my head, but um, there's, um, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is that there's a lot of really interesting toolkits that are already built within the live peer ecosystem that you can just take and make tweaks on top of it to, to add interesting functionalities. Uh, and I'm pretty excited about that. Would it be possible to add extra transcoding steps, like some kind of post-processing or like watermarking, stuff like that? Yes, absolutely. You can do that. Um, you can, um, so, Everything in LivePeer is open source, right? Including the LivePeer node itself. Uh, the LivePeer node currently uh, handles video transcoding for different codecs. It also handles um, smart, smart, smart AV features. So, for example, if you want to transcode, but also do like scene detection to figure out if someone is like streaming adult content on your platform, you can do that, right? Uh, so that, that kind of gives you an idea of like how open-ended it can be when you talk about um, just open source and open video processing. Uh, you can absolutely add, uh, add um, watermarking. You can add com uh, like compositing, right, to add different um, kind of art artifacts on top of that. So it's not just a watermark. It, it can become animated. Um, yeah, all kinds, of, uh, all kinds of cool ideas that can, uh, that can come out of that one. Uh, something is, it's not like, uh, you know, too dull, but maybe too fast. So, you know, like really catering towards people who cannot watch too fast stuff. I just took that idea. I don't have a question, sorry. Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh, one. You, you mentioned that there's a penalty. Similar to proof of stake, I was just wondering what exactly is the penalty? Yeah, that's a really great question. So that's uh, really in the in the core design of the live here protocol, right? And and the idea uh, and the problem that that is trying to solve is that um, you know uh, imagine I I am subversive and I ran a uh, live peer orchestrator on the network and I say hey I provide transcoding services to everybody and you send video to me and I start transcoding video for you but I start ingesting weird videos in, in the middle of your video, or I can just simply return blank videos to you, or I just won't do the work at all, right? Um, so any of those uh, situations are really bad for the quality, of the quality of the network, and we need to have a way to prevent that. So the way to do that is uh, there's a verification mechanism in the protocol that allows uh, the broadcast, uh, uh, allow the person who's using the network to say, I want to periodically verify that and I make, uh, to make sure the work is done correctly. But I won't, uh, you won't tell me which one, uh, which segment that I'm going to verify, uh, that you're going to verify, right? So um, if I am, um, because I am on the network and I'm signing cryptographically for every video segment that I give back to you, you have clear proof and evidence that I said I did the work, right? So if the verification fails, you can submit that proof on chain to say, hey, Eric, Eric cheated, uh, and the protocol will automatically slash me by taking uh, some of my stake uh, li life peer token away. Right? So because in order to participate, I have to have some skin in the game. Uh, and that's just, this is where kind of the, the staking mechanism come in. Again, very similar to how kind of Ethereum staking works. Right? A totally different question because it's not about the technology itself, but um, how do you envision like uh, conquering the world with Live Peer? Uh, so how do you 
compete with, uh, with let's say, Web2 or traditional uh, video transcoding services? Is it a competition based on pricing? Do you claim that you can do it cheaper than, than the competition? Or is it more about that you have more features that it's Web3 enabled? What's the plan there? Oh, man. Uh, what's the plan there? Um, there's definitely that cost uh, aspect, right? Live Peer is 10 times cheaper than Amazon Web Services from an infrastructure cost perspective. And that's just because there is so much spare capacity laying around the world that people can donate to, not all well, people can put on this network and to make a little bit of money back, right? So, um, so that's really interesting. The other thing that's interesting from the long-term perspective, wh which I think is a lesson that we've all learned from the Bitcoin network 10 years ago, is that if you put a simple set of incentive out there and you said this is encoded in the protocol, Everybody, feel free to do whatever you want with it. People are smart, and they figure out how to take advantage, uh, t how to figure out how to, how to game the system by improving their performance to make it a little faster for themselves. And when everybody's doing that, that grows organically like crazy, right? So 10 years later, the Bitcoin network is by far the largest supercomputing network in the world in terms of the, the power of computation, right? Uh, because people started building... Uh, GPU mining software, and for a couple months that was profitable, and, and, and immediately it became FPGAs, and then immediately it became ASICs. Right, and ASICs kept getting faster and faster and faster. So we already see that happening in the live peer network, where ASIC uh, ASIC miners are coming into the network. They're creating video video transcoding specific hardware to be able to compete with uh, kind of traditional um, traditional GPUs. So that will only get better and better over time. Uh, and that's where the, the long-term cost advantage and scalability comes in, right? But I think that's just one angle. The other angle that's, um, that's really interesting is um, this Web3 uh, movement that's happening, right? Uh, and, and the Web3 movement is really about ownership. And it's, it's, a, it's about giving people an opportunity to um, have a more open and transparent system. And that, I think, is highly disruptive to the existing world of um, like video platforms, right? When you, know, you use YouTube, YouTube's take rate is about 50%. That means for every dollar that a creator makes on YouTube, YouTube takes 50 cents from that, right? That is crazy for a platform that is made, uh, is made up of the videos that people upload. They don't make any videos themselves, right? Um, so uh, by, by uh, using Web3, creators essentially get to say, like, I actually own the video myself because it's tied to my Ethereum, Ethereum address, which is on the blockchain layer. The application is simply built on top of the blockchain layer, right? So for, uh, so LivePeer is building the, the video streaming layer for Web3 that has all these hooks into other Web3 um, kind of um, other Web3 components that together creates this Web3 video application stack that allows people to build these types of Web3 native video applications that I think in the long term are going to be, yeah, yeah just very disruptive. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, two questions. First one is, do you think that the the network of uh, transcoders will ever be like spread out enough that you won't need CDN networks and is there like a idea in your mind to build out another set of nodes with a different function that acts as the CDN or anything like that and then the second question is um, if I just uploaded a file to IPFS and included that address in my metadata for an NFT would that work or does it have to be transposed to a mint an NFT? Um, cool. First question about CDNs. Um, so, LivePeer actually already contains software that allows you to deploy your own edge node around the world in order to kind of like run your own delivery, right? And, and for a lot of applications, that works extremely well. Um, we have a you know we, we have a um, a user of LivePeer who runs um, runs an application that has like over 80 million minutes a week, uh, a, a month, and have like over 75,000 streams per month. And it's like pretty popular video streaming network, and 
they don't use a CDN. They just run live peer nodes around the world, um, like a couple, of, like three or four locations around the world, and they're able to handle a lot of traffic that way. Um, so that's a, that's you know the current way to kind of scale your delivery if you don't want to use a centralized CDN. Um, we're also working on a decentralized CDN solution that allows each live peer node to essentially serve as a seed of a swarm of nodes that are living in people's browsers, right? So what that allows you to do is to, to run a live stream and for your viewers to watch the video and deliver the video to each other. So it's not always loading from the network. Uh, and that's the way to, to really scale out. And, and that's, really, that's a really good um, situation for, a uh, really good solution for when a video all of a sudden gets viral, right? And that's kind of the worst situation for a centralized video platform because you know in, a, in centralized planning you already planned out your capacity and when something unexpected like that happens which happens all the time it can be really uh, disruptive to the network that's already pre-provisioned right but in this world when the virality happens it's great because people the people who are coming in to watch those streams are just delivering the video to one another right and that kind of protects the network from this like you know almost like ddos attack right um so that's, that's that. Second question is about um, NFT minting. Um, yeah, you, you absolutely can just like use a video and you know, upload it into IFFS and use that hash and mint the video. Uh, however, um, video, for, uh, video files come in all kinds of different formats. They come in all kinds of different, uh, different resolutions, right? Oftentimes, um, they're not optimized for video streaming on the internet uh, or especially streaming in the browser. Right, so have, uh, you can think of live peers network as almost like a optimization or standardization layer that just processes the video so that it makes sure when you're minting the video, you have like the best file format to do it. Right. Yeah, is it the, is it multiple formats to put in the NFT? Um, currently, it is one format that's like the optimal format. Uh, but yeah, in the in the f in future versions, we'll add in um, kind of flags for people to 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 have a little more flexibility there. Yeah. All right, how are we doing on time? We're all right. Last question. Um, is it technical um, possible to uh, make um, mint out of one NFT video more NFTs? So like, um, for example, editing video, you have one video and some people want to make some art out of it. So, um, and make a second NFT out of the small NFT. Do you want to answer that one? Uh, so you you uh, from from the from l the live viewer perspective the the SDK you could mint the same video multiple times you can also like create the smaller segments of the video and create separate NFTs out of those and but you could also build something maybe even on chain to do something like that maybe you. You have the the NFT, which points to the video, but it has an offset in the video as a metadata. And then your NFT application knows that it's not owning the full video, only part of it. And then you could do, like you could, could create sub NFTs or, or smaller NFTs on, uh, from the same video without needing to re-upload or reprocess that, that video just by start by having that reference. But that would be a custom protocol on, on top of the existing ones. So you would need like your own application to parse it and, and all that. But I, I don't know if I, if I answered the question, is it that okay or? Uh, yeah, it's the question about when you, uh, when you make out of this existing NFT a second one or more small NFTs, that you know the small NFTs are actually from this. Name. Oh, right, yeah. So that that's one thing. Yeah, the, the, the question is if there's a way to know if the smaller file that was minted as the NFT corresponds to the original one that before processing. And that's something that we 
do want to to add as well, which is like when we do the NFT, we upload not only the final process file in the in the right field for the applications to show the video, but we also have a custom property that is like the original video is this, and then you have a different IPFS file, and with the proper application, you could go and and play the the full play or download the full file as well. So you, you can do the both, and you, you right now you can customize the the NFT metadata as well. So you could even build that uh, on top of the SDK. It's already possible to do so. Yeah, all right. Well, thank you all for the awesome questions and thank, thanks for the crowd and thanks to uh, EVE Global for hosting.
Very briefly, what is Tatum? Tatum is a framework which helps developers build applications fast on different chains and uh, on, different, on different protocols. We support a lot of features out of the box. You don't have to build your own nodes. You don't have to do the RPC calls. You just call one of the ready-to-use features and you, are, you can integrate it directly into the application. Uh, you can build basically any app. You can build uh, NFT marketplace, you can build a wallet, you can build some DeFi protocols. Whatever you want, it's just up to you on more than 40 different blockchains. What's the benefits or why should you choose to work with uh, some framework or over the native RPCs? You don't have to know blockchain. You don't have to know how, uh, how RPCs work. You just need to know how those common features work. Under common features or like ready to go features from us, I mean, mean the NFT operation, create wallet operation, sign transaction operation, something very, let's say, easily understandable from the developer perspective. Uh, what actually, like, what was the development process of, of, of building an app inside Atom? You as the developer will, will start with, with playing around with the APIs. You obviously has an idea what you want to build. You will just take a look like, okay, I'm going to build, let's say, NFT marketplace. What I need to do that? I need NFT contract. I need some, some wallets. I need some, some APIs. But you find out, okay, Datum gives me, let's say, 90% of these like ready-to-go features, but I need like 10% of some custom RPC call or some custom operations you need to do on a blockchain. We don't like lock you inside the tools we 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 give you, and uh, like every good framework should give you freedom. And the freedom means if you don't find the things you need in the framework, you just go a level below that framework. And the level below is of of course RPC nodes. With the RPC node you can do whatever you want. And that's basically very, very, very quickly the slides. And now I'm going to focus on like some real live demo, real live hacking. I'm going to show you how the platform works, what you need to do. We're going to mint NFTs. We're going to mint NFTs on Solana. We're going to mint NFTs on Polygon. We're going to, I'm going to show you how Datum KMS works, what it actually is. And I'm going to show you how you can interact between Tatum and a MetaMask if you want to build some kind of DeFi application. So let's quit this. Let's open Postman, my best friend. And uh, from the start, this whole, this whole Postman collection and every example I'm going to show today is available, is available on our public GitHub. I believe you can find github.com slash tatumio. And when you search for the repositories, it should be DevConnect 2022. So there is visible Postman collection, there is present Postman collection, MetaMask page uh, I'm going to show later today, and some README files. So everything is there. You can just play around by yourself. So today's, today's workshop is going to, let's say, I'm going to show you like three three different topics. First topic, the most simplest one is NFTs. I believe you're all curious, like how to work with NFTs. You don't know Solidity, you don't know Rust, you want to mean NFTs on Solana, on Polygon, on any, anything else out there. And for that, we have done the abstraction for you, which means we have already like endpoint where you can very easily mean the NFT on the chain of your choice the like the interface of, of basically all operations we have is trying to be as abstract as, as similar between different chains as possible which means most of the time what you need to change what you need to change when you are doing cross chain application and working with polygon or ethereum or i don't know solana is just the chain parameter inside the request you just sol we're going to work with Solana, which was ETH. We're going to work with Ethereum. But let's start from the scratch. Let's start from the, from the first operation. In order to, to, let's say, work with NFTs, or let's say you, you want to build an application, 
your user has to have a wallet or address or something where he actually receives the NFT or from the, for the address from which he wanna send some other transaction, maybe sold or the NFTs away to someone else. We give you the choice very easily to just generate, generate a Solana wallet and uh, the result of the operation is address and the private key. I wanna say out loud that don't use this endpoint in your production apps because it exposes the private key, it travels through the internet, which means it's compromised. You shouldn't use it, of course. We give you other tools where, which you can use locally in your, in your app, uh, like some client-based SDK or Tatum KMS or Tatum CLI, where you can generate those wallets or do any operations with a private key securely in your perimeter. So let's, we've created a wallet. I think that's, that's uh, let's use it like this for the demo purposes, I, I don't care. What we have actually done, uh, we have called an API call to, to our EU region and you need to pass an, uh, an API key you can obtain in our dashboard when you sign up, which I forgot to show you how to actually do it. So if you head to the datum.io, you hit get started, you can create an API key here you sign up, you create an account, and you can create free API keys from, from which you can, you can build, you can run, you can, you can play around. In the list of the API keys, of course, you can show it, copy paste, use it in your app. So let's get back to the, let's get back to the, to the postman. So I have created an address. I should obviously send some, some Solana tokens there from the from the faucet, so I can perform some transactions. Let's use Sol faucet. When you when you create a testnet API key in our platform for Solana, we are using DevNet because it's a chain which should be used for for developers. So let's send one. Let's send one uh, Sol to my address and let's check if it's there or not. Looks like it is. So I have some balance to work with. Right now, the next step for you, you create an address for a user or for your application. And right now we wanna mint NFT. For minting NFT, again, we have another operation, which is mint NFT, surprise, surprise. And there are some couple of important fields you need to you need to enter in order to mint NFT. For Solana, this is a little bit different than for EVM chains. I'm going to show you later how to mint NFTs on a on a polygon, which is same for any EVM chain. But for Solana, you just need to specify the metadata. The metadata are stored on chain, with, in, in comparison with EVM chains, where you are storing just the URL to the to the IPFS or some other third party metadata storage. And we are gonna use the, the address on which we're gonna mint the NFT. So the recipient is gonna be our address and the minter could be our address as well. Let's use the private key of our, of our created address and let's mint the NFT. I'm gonna mint the NFT some random stuff with some default metadata name, symbol and, and the URL of the, of the image. And Yeah, I forgot to enter the, the verified creator, which is myself. And the result of the operation are three fields. The first and the most important field is a transaction ID. With this transaction ID, you can easily check on the Explorer if the transaction actually passed or not, or you can read the transaction from, through our API. We can see that the transaction looks like passed, it's successful, and the result of the operation is new token which is minted and when we check the token address, the NFT address here in the response, which is the same here, you will actually see the newly minted NFTs. For Solana, we are following the Metaplex standard, which is like 
de facto the only way how to work with NFTs on, on Solana. So we are like fully compatible with any like NFT marketplaces or whatever which supports NFTs on the Solana chain. So great, we have created NFTs and we have sent it to us as the owner. Another step, the logical one, is I want to send an NFT from my address to somewhere else, which again requires transfer operation. In the transfer operation, you again need to define from who you want to send the NFT, what's the private key of that address, who's going to be the recipient, and the contract address represents the actual physical address of that specific NFT. For the Polygon example, we're going to see a small difference because obviously we are missing some kind of identifier of the token. There is no token ID. For EVM chain, there are token IDs because it works slightly different. For Solana, each NFT is a unique, basically, program on the chain which doesn't have additional identifier. So let's use our sender, our sender parameters. Like, I'm going to send the NFT from myself to someone else, and I need to use the correct token which I want to transfer. And the result of the operation is, again, the transaction ID, which we can verify on blockchain that the NFT has actually changed the ownership from myself. It was sent to someone else. Very easily straightforward. In three operations, you can create addresses, you can mint NFTs, you can transfer them. Of course, there's much more to that. In our API documentation, you can find everything you need if you want to like read operation, read metadata, or do some other things with Solana. And now let's do the comparison how the same NFT is minted or how this all is handled on a polygon, which is like L2 for Ethereum. This, this approach is valid for all EVM chains, Ethereum, Celo, Binance Smart Chain, Polygon, Harmony, and anything else we, we have added in our platform. So again, as for the Solana, first step for Polygon is generate the wallet. For EVM chains, we support like HD wallets out of the box. So we give you the mnemonic and extended public key, which points to like millions of addresses under this one specific mnemonic. So we need to do like two additional steps here in order to get one specific address and one specific private key. If you wanna create an address from the from the wallet we have created, you need to say, I wanna create address number zero from this wallet extended public key. Bam, you have an address. If you wanna create address number, I don't know, 1000, you just enter address 1000. You have, I think, up to two, more than two billions addresses available in one, in one mnemonic. But I think we are fine with one. So let's use address number, address number zero, which is this one. We should set, send already some testnet uh, assets. So let's go to Matic Fawcett. And let's send here some. <laughs> of course, of course. I'm gonna use my, I'm gonna use my personal testnet faucet for this. This could happen only on live demo, right? That the faucet is empty. So let's send here, I don't know, zero point. Uh, this is not enough. Let's pick a different account, this one. Let's send there, I don't know, 0 0.5 Matics. Great. Thank you, Matic Fawcett, for helping. <laughs> Let's go back. So in order to obtain a private key from the, from the mnemonic we have created, again, there is operation generate private key from the mnemonic. Again, I'm going to say out loud, don't use it on production. Use some safer ways. I'm going to show you which ones. So from this mnemonic, we are generating private key for address zero. Zero, zero, address, private key, 
it needs to match. One of the biggest problem when developers are playing, playing around, I have used incorrect index, I have used different XPub than Mnemonic and it's not working, blah, 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 blah. Just focus. So we have a private key here. The safest way how to actually validate if this private key points to the address you think it points to is just import it inside MetaMask and you will see that the address is correct and we have a balance. Safest way, just double check. I'm gonna keep this window open, it's wonderful. So we have a balance. We can actually proceed to finally minting some NFTs. On EVM chains, when you wanna work with NFT, first of all, you need to deploy NFT smart contract. Under the NFT abstraction here, we are talking about ERC721s. We also have ERC-1155s available for you, so semi-fungible tokens. The, let's say, steps for working with them are basically the same as for 721s, just a small nuances. So let's create new NFT, let's deploy it on Matic chain with some random symbol, and we are gonna pay the transaction cost from our private key from our address. The result is transaction ID. You have, we have created like a very, let's say, useful some kind of utilities for like smooth, like flow of the application, which means you wanna deploy an FT, obviously you wanna find out what's the contract address of the deployed, of, uh, of the deployed contract. So we have created a very, let's say, small utility. From this transaction ID, tell me what's the contract address. And voila, the contract address is here. So we don't have to verify it on a polygon scan or somewhere else. And for example, if you are building some kind of, let's say, NFT heavy application, when you are like real time deploying new NFTs, you need to do programmatically these kind of operations. You, you, must, have, you must have a tool for that. So we have deployed a contract, and right now we, we finally can mint our NFT. The difference, again, between Solana and, and EVM chains is that the 11721 um, and 1155 standards both requires the metadata to be stored off-chain somewhere else and stores only the pointer to that metadata you wanna, you wanna attach to the NFT. So in order to actually meet NFT, you need to have some kind of URL which you wanna use. Most of the NFTs out there are using some decentralized storage uh, systems like IPFS, Filecoin, ARView, et cetera, et cetera. We have, integrated, uh, we have integrated IPFS where you can very easily, again, in one API call, basically store any, anything you want on IPFS and you receive the IPFS CID. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna store some crazy build smart contract compilation information to the NFT. I actually don't care. Usually what, what you are storing in the metadata is really up to any application. If you are building some, let's say, if you're a content creator and are creating music or art or videos, you are storing there some videos. If you are working uh, on a project which, where you're gonna mint those NFT as a utility NFT, which could represent tickets, it could represent memberships, it could represent, I don't know what, some fractional ownership of some piece of land, why not? You will obviously store the metadata something else than an image. But let's just store this, uh, this file on IPFS and the result is a IPFS identifier. So in the mint operation, we can actually mint NFT with some metadata. We are gonna use the deployed smart contract we have, we have deployed as a contract address. We are gonna work on Matic chain. This is the recipient of the NFT we are gonna mint. This is the private key which will mint NFT. So 
we need to use our private key. We are going to send the NFT to us. And we are going to mint NFT number one. The token ID in the 7 to 1 world should be some integer or, well, integer. Really extremely huge integer, 256 bits it can have if someone is interested. So we can create a really a lot, a lot, a lot of tokens under one contract. So let's mint. Obviously, the result is a transaction ID of the operation, and we can check this transaction ID on the on the faucet, uh, on the on the polygon scan. The result of the operation is NFT, which was minted from zero address to me as a as a as a recipient with some metadata attached. Same as for Solana, we want to transfer this NFT somewhere else. So we're going to use the same V3 slash NFT slash transaction operation as we were using for transferring the, the Solana NFT. If you're going to work with Ethereum, again, we're going to use the same operation. That's what we call called once deploy on every chain. So let's transfer our our NFT on the Matic chain, right? We're gonna transfer NFT token number one to new recipient from and we're gonna transfer it from our address. And here you go. Again, transaction ID. In the meantime, Polygons can finally load it, our transaction, and we can see that we have minted NFT from zero address to ourselves. It was token number one. You can see that. If we take a look on how the actual like, parameters of the operation look like, you can see that we have minted token number one to this recipient, and this is the metadata connected to it. So everything we have entered in the operation is visible on the chain. And let's check the transfer transaction. The transfer transaction is, again, very straightforward. We can see that we are transferring NFT number one from ourselves to someone else. And that's basically, I don't think I have anything more to say regarding the transfer. If you want to now support not, not Matic, but you want to work on a, on a Binance Smart Chain, or you want to work on Ethereum, or you want to work on Solo, or you want to work on Harmony, this all is available basically only via changing the configuration of the request. We give you not only the, the right operations, but if you want to build some reasonable application and it should like have full set of features you, you want to use, you need also you also need to read. You need to read which NFTs are held by which addresses, what you own, what was the NFT transactions, how the NFT travels between the the different accounts on the chain. We have these operations available for you as well. We got you covered. So, for example, if I want to see the the balance of one specific address which nfts it owns we can just check this one and you can see like this was my address and the address owns these token ids on this specific nft contract with some metadata attached so you can see i have already play around with my metadata file i think i should have used something smaller <laughs> But I think you get the point where we are. You can see all the balances of a specific address. The time when those NFTs appears in this endpoint varies how fast we index the data internally. On the faster chains, it's pretty fast. We can, we can scan Polygon quite near to real time. For slower chains like Ethereum, it can take like two to three minutes since the transaction appears in the blog and since we do our internal stuff. 
There are, of course, more operations than just get NFTs by address. Everything can be found in the API doc, which I think I should show how you can get there. Inside the resources, there is a API doc link where you can see a list of all the operations we support. And we, are, we were talking today about NFT section. So you can see here all the operations you can do on top of the NFT. Here are some write operations. Here are some read operations, get NFT transactions by address, etc., etc., etc. Everything you need to do in order to build something, something real. This is basically, basically pretty much it in terms of the NFT workshop. And right now I wanna focus on, on the KMS and I wanna focus on the, on the MetaMask. Because yes, we have played around with APIs. We have like pretty like decent understanding how the flow should look like, what operations should we do. But this is actually not how you're gonna build your production application. You're not gonna send private keys over the internet to us to sign something. You can do it, some projects do that, but please don't, <laughs> please don't, 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 don't. This is just for you for playing around. As I said at the beginning, we have other options how, how you can like build the, the, the production application. One of the option is uh, to use our client libraries Tatum.js, it's a JavaScript SDK, which you can download, you can include it in your app, on your backend or on your frontend, and do all these like sensitive operations locally. I mean, generate wallets or signing transactions. The SDK looks pretty simple when I open some, some let's say, uh, unit test, which actually shows you how the how the SDK looks like. You are building on top of the SDK, you wanna work with a transaction section and you're gonna mint NFTs. The body of those, uh, of those calls are near, are almost the same as for the API calls. It's just the different wrappers on top of some, on top of some, some objects in the, in the JavaScript. But basically we are reusing one-to-one Datum.js format inside REST APIs. But you can use your private key here because obviously you will include this in your backend. So if you are building some custodial application, some custodial wallet or custodial marketplace, and you are already managing the private keys of your users, you can like use the private keys on your side. If you are not using if you are not building, uh, <clears throat> if you are not building custodial solution, but you are building something, something let's say more DeFi, and you want your users to <coughs> sign their own operations with MetaMask or with something else, you actually want to know how to how to do it, how to sign some transaction, how to sign mint NFT operation uh, with MetaMask. You know, like I want to use the same like cool features, the same abstraction methods, same mint NFT, transfer NFT operations, but I wanna let the users to sign that. I have created very, very ugly example HTML page <laughs> where we actually gonna connect this page with a MetaMask. We choose some, some, some account in the MetaMask and we're actually gonna mint that specific NFT using MetaMask with the signing, and then we can take a look inside the code how this all was done. I need to choose a correct account for this. I think it was this one. Yep, I think it was this one. So I'm gonna, first of all, I need to like enable MetaMask, connect some account from the MetaMask, and then I'm gonna internally mint NFT with some specific token ID with some random metadata. I, I actually don't care what I'm gonna mint, I just wanna show you how to mint it. So 
I don't think this will work because I think I have wrong I have wrong account yeah exactly so let's dig dive into the code before that this is what needs to be changed I need to use my API key, of course, because I'm going to communicate with the platform. I'm going to perform some POST request to the API. And I think there was another one here. And what I'm going to do, I'm going to basically use the same request as I was using for minting. I'm just gonna replace the from private key with some placeholder value, which we internally understand, and we just like give you the recipe to be used inside MetaMask. So I'm gonna use this contract address I have deployed. I'm gonna mint it here to this guy with some metadata and I need to connect the correct correct account inside MetaMask, which was the last one. EFD, yeah. <clears throat> so let's connect to MetaMask. Let's try to mint an FTEs. And MetaMask window pops up. It was correctly connected. You can see that I can sign some transaction Let's sign it, and the result is shown here. Again, transaction ID, and we can check it on the polygon scan if it's actually working or not. This looks like a magic. Internally, it's very, it's very simple. Internally, what we are actually doing, we are leveraging the, the standard MetaMask uh, interface, how the MetaMask connects to the, to the blockchain application, where we just work with the Ethereum object in the, in the JavaScript world. And then for minting NFT, as I said, we are using the same API call as we're using in the demo, but instead of a private key, we are using a signature ID. Signature ID for us means that we don't sign the transaction with the private key in our API, but we just prepare a transaction object it should be signed later on. It could be signed inside MetaMask or it could be signed inside our key management system, which is Statum KMS, which I'm gonna talk like in the next one minute. You can enter any signature ID here. We just mint the we just send the mint operation, we receive some some response, we perform reading that response, so we're actually fetching the transaction object which we want to sign inside MetaMask and just do some magic and send the transaction config for signing to the MetaMask. I'm not saying it's simple. I'm saying it's like 30 lines of code, but this operation you are doing right now could be anything. It could be minting NFT. It could be sending Ethereum. It could be transferring uh, ERC-1155. It could be some approval on top of the smart contract. It could be whatever. Anything you want to prepare on the client could be signed with this approach with MetaMask. So if you want to build quite quickly uh, some DeFi app, you want to use MetaMask, you can leverage all our pre-built pieces of functionality, all the features using this way and just let the MetaMask do the, do the signing. And then, like the last part of the workshop, is going to be the completely opposite type of application. And we are going to talk about the custodial application we want to build and the way how to, ex how to work securely with the private keys if you are building a custodial solution. I've seen crazy things. I've seen projects who are storing private keys non-hashed in the Postgres database on their application server. I saw projects who are sending private keys over internet, they don't care. 
eventually all of them like stopped working because they got hacked or like <laughs> there was some other problems connected to that. But none of like, if you want to build something really serious, something which should survive at least first hacker attack from, from some random guy, you need to really understand and pay attention to working with the private keys. If you don't do it properly, you can be like really in a bad place or in a bad situation. What's like unfortunate is that m like it's not unfortunate, but more and more new developers are joining Web3 space. More and more Web2 people are trying to build something on top of the blockchain, but they actually don't have any previous experience. They, they don't know what's the correct patterns. They don't know that private key must be stored securely. They don't know like how to do it and what's the correct flow. And because of these, there's, there's so many problems and so many like failed projects or hacked projects out there. In Dayton, we understand that, and that's why we're trying to guide you, using, trying to guide you to use proper design patterns while building your app. And actually, you can't do it badly if you follow like these main ideas. And the KMS is basically that example. So I'm really going to start showing that because we are bad on time. If you want to, like Tatum KMS is a, is a key management system, which means it's a small tool which runs, again, on your infrastructure, which holds the private keys, the mnemonics, everything on your side and it automatically communicates with our API on the cloud, like fetching some transactions which should be signed from the API, signs it locally and broadcast it to the blockchain. With this setup, you basically, your private keys never leaves your perimeter. The private keys leaves, uh, lives in your server secured as you secure them because the transactions are being fetched, private keys are not being sent away. If you wanna work with the KMS, you need to pull the KMS Docker. And you need, and first step which you wanna do is basically set up a wallet file which will like securely hold all your private keys. For that, there is like a bunch of uh, CLI commands y you can work with. The most easiest one is generate managed wallet or store managed private key if you have like external private key. I have example of these calls in the readme. So right now I'm gonna store my pre-generated private key for the existing Polygon account. I just need to point out the, the correct volume on my drive and say, hey, Tatum KMS, I want to store manage private key for a Matic on the testnet chain. The door could just start. It will ask me for the private key, which I want to store, which I believe is this one. It will ask me for the password, which uh, is used for encryption of the wallet file. For the first time, just enter some password you want. Second time, you'll have to repeat it. My favorite password is 12345. And the result of the operation is that Tatum KMS grabs the private key, stores it in the wallet file, and generates signature ID, which actually represents the private key inside this KMS instance. Right now, my KMS can start fetching transactions which are connected or sent with this signature ID. So let's say I want to mint new NFT. I want to mint NFT number 10. But instead of a private key, I'm going to use 
signature ID and tells and this inform this like body tells the API internally that hey this guy will to store the transaction for the KMS signatures later on. So the result of the operation is not the transaction ID on the chain because not no signatures were, were done, no transaction was broadcast to the chain. The result is some identifier of the, tra of the operation which should be signed later on. You can get the details of that operation using KMS get details stuff. And you can see here some, let's say, information where the most important pieces are the chain. We are working on Matic. The serialized transaction field is actually the transaction which will be signed inside the KMS. And the hashes field represent the private keys which should be used from KMS to sign the payload. So right now the transaction is still in, let's say, the spending state, and once the transaction is signed, there's gonna be new field takes ID present with a specific transaction ID. What we need to do from the KMS perspective, we need to run it in a Docker mode. If we wanna like start KMS fetching, if we wanna KMS to start fetching the transactions from our API, we need to run it as a docker daemon using this command. You are actually saying, hey KMS, I wanna start you in a daemon mode. This is my API key, so under this API key you should, uh, you should communicate with the API. I wanna see only transactions which are connected to Polygon on the testnet network. So right now I have one transaction pending inside my inside my API key space. So KMS daemon will start. You need to enter, of course, the, the password to decrypt your wallet store. And KMS starts fetching the transactions from the from the platform. I think we have a lot of transactions there under these signature IDs which I don't like for any reason. But I think this one is the one. Oh, not this one. Let's see if this one got processed. It got, luckily. So let's take a look what happened here. Under my API key, I have a lot of other pending transactions which should be signed. One of those pending transaction was mine, and the transaction got picked up by the KMS. It was signed, broadcasted, and the transaction ID was attached to that KMS to that KMS transaction object. We can right now check on the on the polygon scan, like if the transaction actually passed or not. And yes, it looks like we have really minted token number ten as we want it. And when you take a look how we actually did it, we haven't sent the private key anywhere. The private key remains secret and safe inside our KMS. I know it was a lot, but right now it's time for any questions you might have for. I think we have a microphone somewhere. I, I don't need the microphone, I'm okay. Okay, go ahead. So thank you very much for your presentation. It was, it was very, it was very fair. You used MetaMask, but can I say that assume I could use any other kind of wallet and just to replace MetaMask for for the yep. connection? Yep. For the stream, the question is if uh, I can replace the MetaMask with any other uh, wallet, like Wallet Connect or whatever else. Yeah. If the like if the principles, how those like wallets are working are similar to, to MetaMask, so you are passing the, the transaction configuration which should be signed, then yes, you can use whatever. It's really up to you. Okay. Awesome, there's any more questions?
questions, we can, hey, another one, great. <laughs> NFT related video, so is it just NFT at this point or? Uh, what do you mean by that? So can, 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 you have it with the NFT, mm -hmm. but if I take for example have an NFT related video in this case, mm -hmm. would, would, this, would this also work? Or is it just restricted to NFT for now? Well, if you mean like NFT minted video is like actually the existing NFT already on the chain and you want to remint it again? Yeah. Yes, you can because like technically speaking, this is just mint NFT and I don't care what I'm minting. Like you can mint whatever token on, on with whatever metadata. So it's really up to you what you want to mint. If you are want to create new NFT, this is the operation. What's actually inside that NFT, it's really up to you. Okay, guys, if you will have any more questions, we are here, like, yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for the talk. And, uh, since you supported the EVM chains, the EVM chains, and the uh, function, uh, do you have plans to add the bridging functionality to your SDK, like using the this kind of bridging? Mm -hmm. The question was, again, for the, for the stream, uh, that we have a lot of EVM chains uh, integrated and if we plan to add some bridging functionality. Uh, what we have available in each of our integration of every blockchain is that you can easily, let's say, call smart contract. You can perform write operation on any smart contract available on that specific chain. So if there is a bridge already, which is a smart contract base, which usually they are, you can actually right now working with that bridge just by invoking that bridge method, for example. We're gonna send an empty there and call something on the bridge. Yes, from the abstraction perspective right now, we like don't plan to add some custom bridges or, or like do abstraction for existing bridges. Uh, if you wanna like bridge yourself those NFTs and build it by yourself, you have a couple of options. You can create, you can like integrate some existing bridge or you can like deploy your NFT contract different chains and basically create your own bridge that you will like burn on one or bin on another one and basically will bridge like this with some metadata connections between those or which is even better solution. You can basically send your NFT to some specific address which you own and you say that this is my bridge you will mean another one and like do it by yourself. Oh, yes, you can. Yeah, it would be great. Yeah. Okay, guys, I think we are on time. So thank you all. And as I said, we are here to tomorrow on Sunday as well to answer any questions. Thank you.
Um, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm gonna ask you to just like, before we check on you, about a minute as soon as I get to the back. Okay. Just get through yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm moving some things around before showering. <laughs> yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. Okay. I know someone who's going to need a microphone right away, actually. We're co presenting. Yeah. Oh, nothing. Just go with it. It. Um, no, I told him that you're will be cool. Thank you. Oh, yeah, it does. I'm just moving things around, so... It's a wait moment. So. Good to go? All right. Hi, everybody, uh, and thanks for tuning in, especially if you're on the live stream watching this um, from down in the Hackett area or across the pond, as they were saying earlier. Uh, so I'm Christine from Scale Labs. I'm really excited to um, be at ETH Amsterdam I'm doing this workshop. The primary goal of the workshop is to, one, explain more in depth what Scale is all about, and also give you an update about V2 from a surprise guest, <laughs> and then also do some live coding uh, for those that kind of want to follow along using some tools that you, sh you should already be familiar with. And if you're not, don't worry, we'll slow it down and make sure that everyone can catch up. So um, before launching into that, just want to remind everyone about the prizes. We do have a lot of prizes to win today. Um, so if you are going for the grand prize, it's pretty much using uh, having the best use case of scale integrated within your application. That means potentially using some of our additional features, file storage, interchain messaging, et cetera, et cetera. We'll definitely get into what that is all about um, later. We also have two other categories. If you're developing a metaverse, P2E, or NFT game, um, all teams that win this will share up to five 
$5,000. And then for partner integrations, if you see any partners walking around um, that you want to try to integrate onto scale, you can definitely do that and you'll share up to $2,000 for teams that are hacking on that. And then last but not least, any team that hacks and deploys an application onto the scale network will split $4,000 among yourselves. So really excited to see what gets built um, today. And if you have your phones ready, definitely go ahead and scan that QR code. It will take you directly to the information you need to get started. All right, so what is scale? So scale is a layer that sits on top of Ethereum that pretty much allows you to speed up your um, smart contracts and then also removes the, the gas costs. Now, what's great about this is it fits really well with an Ethereum ecosystem. So all the tools that you love um, that exist in Ethereum automatically works on the, scale, on the scale network as well. You don't have to pr program a new language. You don't have to change your tech stack. You can simply just migrate everything over to scale using an, an Infura-like endpoint as you see here. And I'll get into how you can actually do that using some tools here. Um, Remix, we might go through Truffle if we have time, um, but definitely um, uh, explaining Web3 and EtherJS as well. All right, so how does this all work? We have nodes around the world, and what ends up happening is when you decide you want a scale chain, we group together a subset of those nodes. We take 16. And what this means is your scale chain has its own uh, environment. It allows you to process transactions, but it also has file storage, meaning that you can store files directly to the blockchain. So let's say you wanted to host your website or stream videos. You can upload that to the file system and have it just automatically um, displayed to you because we have an NGNX layer that sits on top of that. Uh, additionally, we have interchain messaging, which is a bridge that connects you between Ethereum and Scale. Um, so that means that all of your assets you've already developed on Ethereum, you can migrate them over to Scale. Or if you haven't yet started, you can start minting on Scale directly and migrate them later, thus by saving even more gas. One of the things that we do um, is we run to rotate the nodes ever so frequently. So this adds a layer of protection because I know what everyone's thinking out there, 60 nodes, that may not be a lot, but when you think about the random rotation, over time you can potentially have 70%, 90%, 100% of the network might have worked for your scale chain at any point in time. And we do this to make sure that nodes can't collude. Um, if you want to learn more about that, definitely come see us at the booth. Um, our VP of product, Chadwick, would love to go in detail about that, as well as our BD team. I'm going to call out some few. Ryan, Connor, Fabio, who else is here? <laughs> Alex as well. Can definitely give you a rundown on um, all that's involved there. All right. But this is a fun thing. Um, we're a multi-chain network. And it's one of the first of its kind. So I know you probably have been seeing the news and you've been seeing other networks trying to migrate to do the same thing. It's really cool to see that you know, other applications are now seeing the value about this and now trying to integrate that within their applications as well. So definitely um, check to see how we're doing it here because one of the things that's really exciting about this week is we are launching something called the Scaleverse, which is basically a V2 of the Scale network. And what that V2 allows you to do is add organization around the scale chains. So we listened to our community, and our community submitted proposals, which was amazing, that said that they wanted to band together to create hubs. So we have exchange hubs, which is all your liquidity. Um, we have some amazing exchanges, some amazing partners that are gonna be launching there over the next few weeks, as well as marketplace um, hubs as well. We have marketplaces that said, hey, we wanna join the scale network and provide an ecosystem to where um, any NFT project or any project that has an NFT can list their NFT on the scale network and have it transfer act in a free environment. How cool is that? <laughs> and then lastly, because you know a lot some of the community they don't necessarily want to manage their own scale chain. They want to use what's existing kind of like how they leverage Ethereum. And so that's where community chains come into play. Instead of having to manage your own scale chain, if you just want to deploy your application, we have an environment for you to be able to do that and a hub like environment as well. But then lastly, you know, there are a lot of the applications out there that have said, we want our own chain. We want to make sure that our transactions per second isn't deprecated because of another game or another application running, and our speed stays the same. And the only way that that is viable is through a multi-chain architecture, which is the thing that we started with our vision from the beginning. And so really excited to see this come to life with Scale V2. But there's so much more to that, and I think Chadwick should probably come up and explain a little bit more. You ready to come up? <laughs> now, I don't have a slide for him, so you're going to have to listen carefully to all the additional features coming into Scale V2.
everyone. Chawick here, VP of Product. Uh, so just to piggyback on Christine's intro, uh, the key thing with the hubs and with V2, we've taken the interchain messaging agent, which is the native bridge deployed on scale chains. Uh, and for several months, that's been operating very well between Ethereum and scale, uh, transacting and transferring tokens and arbitrary messages between Ethereum and scale. And now that we've, we've expanded that to uh, basically help promote and drive the Scaleverse, the sort of hub and uh, dApp chain communication model, by allowing any two scale chains to transact uh, tokens or messages, basically sending tokens and messages between any two scale chains with the same uh, bridge layer that we have using BLS signatures. But the key thing here is, okay, it's a bridge, but it's a bridge that can transfer tokens between any two scale chains in a gas, cost-free gas environment. So you don't pay any gas fees transferring tokens between any two scale chains. And the resolution time between any two scale chains is very fast. It's 18 seconds. Um, so we've taken that bridge from Ethereum to scale and applied this between any two scale chains. Um, on top of this, we didn't stop there. V2 includes this, but also includes what we call an RNG endpoint. It's very difficult for Solidity developers to find a really good uh, source of entropy to drive like the randomness of maybe NFT properties, lottery design, um, or other deeper functions that you'd want to do in smart contracts. There are other options out there like VRFs um, and other options as well, but we decided on scale because of the uniqueness of our architecture and how we use BLS threshold signatures amongst the nodes that comprise your skill chain we're able to leverage this in a very easy way to allow developers to basically call a pre-compiled contract on each skill chain that delivers a random number, gener a random number for every uh, block that's created. It's a really easy way. It doesn't, cr doesn't create any external calls that you have to do. It's basically a very simple uh, assembly code that you can uh, copy and paste in a contract and integrate very easily. We also have an Oracle API. We have the base layer available now. Um, we're finishing a few aspects of that, but it'll allow basically any developer to create an RPC call or an RPC uh, call to any uh, external off-chain data and then allow the skill chain, the nodes in the skill chain, to uh, request that data from, uh, from off-chain and bring that inside, come to an agreement about what that off-chain data is, and then present it uh, for available uh, verification and solidity. Um, and then, did I forget anything? I think that was it. That's it. Yeah, that's it for V2. Yeah. So, scale chain transfer, oracles, RNG, oh my, Wizard of Oz. <laughs> so, it's pretty exciting though. I, I think uh, we're really excited for the Scaleverse because it's really just showing the power of a multi-chain network. And I really want to stress that, multi-chain network. Started from the beginning, vision number one, and we're really excited to see it um, you know, evolve into what it is today. Um, with that Oracle piece, though, I think we're really excited because um, we do um, partner with other Oracles. Um, but I think you know, giving developers the option to have an Oracle that's native to the chain, I think, is also unique. Because when you think about what the Scale um, Network is trying to do, it's not just creating another blockchain. It's creating a blockchain with um, a platform of features. So file storage, the Oracle, RNG, the list just goes on. Machine learning, which was something that we sunsetted, but we had before. Like, it's really exciting to see Scale Lab Labs, Labs, Scale L2, <laughs> develop amazing things over and over and over again. All right. So now I think it's really cool to take a step back and see what cool things can you build on Scale. And with fast finality, no gas fees, and high throughput, it feels like the possibilities are endless. And we didn't build a blockchain that was just for NFTs. We didn't build a blockchain that was just for games. We built a blockchain for every application out there. And that takes time to build. <laughs> so where we are today means that now the applications can take what the features that are there and build these really cool applications. So with fast finality, 
we were able to deploy oracles. But other oracles could also create on this modular system as well. Media paywall, authentications. The no gas fees mean that NFT projects can launch their application without having to raise a lot of capital first. They can simply launch their application, prove product market fit, and then move forward from there. And that's a game changer when you think about how things currently operate in Ethereum ecosystem. Being able to just launch your application or your DAO without having to figure out how to pay the high gas fees. And then high throughput. One of the things that we did at one of the ETH conferences um, a couple of years ago was we took Unity, <laughs> we took one of their templates, we put it on scale, and saw how it worked. And it worked extremely well, extremely fast. And one of the feedbacks that we always get from game developers is, is that when they use the scale network, they can de develop for their application and not for the blockchain. And that's a different way of thinking about approaching development. So really cool to see all these different applications that you can develop. Now, what are some applications that have developed on us? Well, Ruby Exchange is a really great partner of ours. It's going to be launching one of the first exchanges within Scale Network. And what's cool is that Liquidity Hub that I talked about, the organization, they're going to be at the forefront of that, making sure that you can bring liquidity in and out very seamlessly. Uh, they're really good with uh, marketing, as you can see. That's one of their videos. Very flashy, very amazing. Um, but what I'll do, though, is actually show you their application. And let me come here. So this is the Ruby application. And it's just on, on the test network for now, because they're going to be launching in the next few weeks. But what's really cool is that they're allowing um, developers to easily bridge over um, current um, you know, standardized tokens, USDC, USDT, the list goes on. And if you want to add your custom token, they are a great partner to make sure that you can do that within the scale network. They've also integrated with our faucet to distribute S-Fuel. And I know I haven't talked about that, but I promise I'll bring you up to speed on that in just a bit. Um, but this faucet makes sure that anyone that doesn't have permission to process transactions on the scale chain can do so. And I think that was a really cool way of how they integrated that within their application. What are some other applications that have developed? IV Cash. This is a really great NFT project. You don't have to have a wallet or understand blockchain to be able to get an NFT. And they prove that by allowing anyone to create a, um, a QR code, present it on a screen, add a game, or anywhere, scan that QR code, and simply have an NFT show up in your wallet that's created for you. And so that's a different model than saying, hey, how about you download an application here, understand blockchain, make sure you save your private key, and then, oh, make sure you didn't change to the correct endpoint. They remove all of the friction for their end users. And so when you think about um, creating an application with design in mind, using an application such as Layer 2, that the skill allows you to do that and achieve that because, again, we have a no-gas environment. The last one I'll talk about is going to be Clet Name Services. What's cool about them is that they built an application that allows you to uh, reserve your name. So it could be christine.eth, it could be my daughter is a horror.eth, it could be chadwick.eth. But essentially, when you reserve that, um, it then actually resolves to the wallet address. And they have a really great API as well. So they have two sides of their product. One side is for um, you know, users to actually get their names, reserve them, and be able to attach it to their wallets. The other side is for DAP developers to integrate that within their applications. So they have a fully-fledged, um, built-out API that allows you to do that. But not just to um, you know, integrate their name service, but ENS and Unstoppable Domains as well. As well. They're covering the entire suite of domain name servicing, which I think is a really awesome way of using um, Scale as well. So when you're buying your um, names on their application, within the Scale system, it all happens in the background. The user doesn't have to know that, you're on, that they're on Scale. They're just simply there. They're buying their name with a credit card, and that is it. So again, another great use case for usability. All right. We're finally at the live demo portion. I hope I didn't kill you by slides. Looks like I didn't. Everyone's still up. Everyone's still looking this way. That is great. <laughs> um, do I have developers in the room? Or are we here to watch? I know I have developers out there that's watching on the live stream, but I can't talk to you. So, Developer, OK, one, two, three. Ish, three, okay, three, three in the room. That's good. So in that case, what I'll do is I'll um, kind of go through a little bit of the coding aspect of Scale um, because I think it's really cool to see how seamless and how easy it is to get up and running. All right, so I'm going to switch back here to my lovely browser. We're going to exit out of this. Goodbye, Ruby. We still love you. All right, 
So the documentation portal, and I'm going to back up just a bit because there's a lot of information on here. Uh, you can thank, again, Chadwick, our VP of product, for organizing all of this and making sure that everything's ready for the Scale V2 launch. But if I navigate here to develop, there's a plethora of information on how to use, again, those existing tools that I promised you guys. Um, or just deploying to the Scale network if you already know what to do, you just want to go it alone. Um, but let's use something that most developers are familiar with, Remix. A lot of developers have used this, you've come across this in some capacity for just simply deploying a smart contract. Well, what you'll see here is that all of these tools have step-by-step -step instructions on how they use that with the Scale network. And one of the things that reigns true with most of these is that the deployment or um, the usage of these is just as simple as changing an endpoint. So if I go to this MetaMask example here, there you go, just changing an endpoint. Portis, same thing, simply just changing an endpoint. And I think because of the way the Ethereum space has evolved, all tools that are building within that space makes it so that way you can integrate with other layers outside of Ethereum, and it's shown here. Now for Remix, it's more or less the same. Um, you can take this example smart contract, copy it into Remix, and just run it by deploying on the Scale network. So let me show you what that looks like. If I click on this link, actually let's back up. I'm going to open it into a new browser tab. All right, perfect. We have a simple smart contract called Hello Scale. Um, super simple, but um, one of the things that um, you'll know is that you could always connect it to MetaMask by switching it to Injected Web3. And here we're on MetaMask. I'll switch it back to the Ethereum network. But um, because we're at the hackathon, if you go to, oops, let's not open that. <laughs> if you go to ethamsterdam.scale.network, this will give you all the information that you need for getting a scale chain endpoint and accessing a faucet while you're at this endpoint, uh, as while you're at this conference, to be able to get it going. So if I click here, there are two scale chains available, and I'm going to select the first one. Now, I can go the manual way of copying this, opening MetaMask, and adding it to um, you know, my list of networks, or I can do it the automatic way, which is click on this button here, and it will automatically add it for me. Now, I'll go ahead and switch networks. And what I want to do is jump back just for a second to the documentation, because if you want to understand exactly how we created that button, all of the code for doing that is simply here. You can copy, paste, and just have it work. So I'm going to go back here to Remix. And now that I'm on the scale chain, as you can see, I don't have any um, SKE, which has been rebranded to SFuel, actually. And SFuel essentially is a token that exists on a blockchain just to prevent DDoS attacks. It has no monetary value, which means you can use it as an authentication um, mechanism. So if I come back here, and I'm going to go back, um, I'm gonna back up a little bit, and what I'll do is, let's see, I'm going to copy this endpoint, paste it here, and then I'll come here and get my wallet. Okay, super simple paste that here, and then simply click on Get SFuel. What this basically shows you is just a faucet um, mechanism for setting up distributing that SFuel. You can just as easily um, distribute SFuel the moment you recognize this user when they log into MetaMask. But now that I have SFuel, I can go back to Remix and simply deploy the smart contract onto um, the scale chain. All right, just want to make sure everything's connected. As long as this green light is going, we're good to go. And let's go ahead and click Deploy. One of the things you'll notice is just how inexpensive it may seem to deploy the smart contract. And that's by design. Because again, it's a gas-free environment. <laughs> but we still want to make sure that no one can DDoS you. And so over time, if someone is trying to DDoS you, this um, number will simply increase by um, a predetermined number until they run out of SFuel. And you can decide just not to top them up, which means they're blocked from running transactions on your blockchain. Now, if I confirm this, that'll do what you expect will happen in any other blockchain. It deploys a smart contract to scale. And from there, I'm able to transact with it just like I would if this were running on Ethereum. And so just as I promised, very simple to transfer over from Ethereum to scale. Now, 
One of the other things that we can do is let's check out one of those really cool features that Chadwick mentioned. Um, I like the idea of checking out the um, RNG endpoint. One, because um, I think the documentation is really well done where you can simply copy, paste, run. Now I'll copy this and I'll come over here and I'll paste this here. Let's go ahead and save that. Good, looks like it's already compiled. And I'll delete that one. And we will simply redeploy. All right, give that a moment. And this is that random number generator that Chatwick had mentioned. What's cool is that in scale v2, this is going to come standard on every blockchain. And so one of the things that we kept getting asked about is that, you know, with scale being a costless environment, do you guys have a random number generator? And if so, can we use it? Do you have code snippets? Well, we took it a step further. We don't just provide you the code snippet. We provide it, um, you know, standardized with every blockchain. So you can just simply access it. And so every time I click on get random, every time there's a new block, a new random number is presented to you. Um, so a really cool way of using one of the new tools that's coming out um, in Scale V2. All right, so before continuing on, um, I will pause if anyone has any questions. Straightforward so far? Everyone's following? I see nods, I see nods. Okay, no one's sleep yet, this is great. I know it's midnight. All right. All right, so again, I think the main thing I wanna drive home here is just um, you know the simplicity of using the scale network, um, but also the complexity of the features that we have available. <laughs> and one of those complexities, I think, is drawn out in interchain messaging. So if you're here building a token and you wanna make sure that it can um, transverse between different chains or different blockchains re between Ethereum and Scale um, or reverse from Scale to Ethereum, this is the, um, the, the documentation that you wanna land on. Um, now there's a lot here. We have um, support for all of the major token standards, ERC-20, ERC-721, ERC-1155, and then any custom smart contract. Now that is very unique because a lot of the bridges out there only support ERC-20. But with the support for all of these, what that means is that you can really transfer any asset to scale, even as far back as CryptoKitties, <laughs> or um, create any new standard and simply have it work within the scale network with being able to transfer that back and forth. Now we have some really cool um, diagrams here um, that help you just sort of like understand what the flow looks like. So you're not going on, th on this alone. Where I'm a visual person, I hope so you are too. And so having a, a clear way of understanding how to move a token between the different chains is extremely helpful. And that minting first um, methodology that I mentioned um, is down here, where we give you a simple flow of understanding how to first mint um, an NFT or any asset on the scale network and then move it to Ethereum after the fact, thus by saving you even more gas. So I encourage any blockchain project that's looking to hack at this hackathon to try it out, because um, this would be a really cool way of integrating it within your NFT project, your P2E game, or your metaverse application. All right. Let's go back here. All right, one last thing. Um, since we have everyone's attention, we do have $100 million in USD for an uh, ecosystem grant for program, and that's gonna be specifically for gaming. So if you're here building a game, definitely come talk to us. That way we can see um, where you are in your development and to see if we can get you um, into this grant program. But looks like we had a question before I concluded. Yeah, where, where would you um, use the scale chain to scale chain? bridge? How would you use it? Mm. The scale chain to scale chain bridge. I'm actually going to go back here because I think, uh, let me show this one. All right. Uh, great question, by the way. And the question was, for those that are um, viewing this, how would you use the scale chain to scale chain bridge? Uh, the best way to think about that is, let's first explain um, you know, the layout here. We have these exchange hubs, which are providing liquidity. 
meaning all liquidity is coming into that one chain and other chains that are creating um, complementary like uh, Exchange Hub as well. We have NFT marketplaces, which means that all NFTs are going to be viewable within one endpoint, one chain, um, which is great for developers because things are able to be shown in collections, which is very important if you are building an NFT project. And those community chains where we have a lot of applications that want to share space because they don't necessarily need 70 gigabytes <laughs> for storage or um, 200 transactions per second for their medium chain. They just want a small subset of that. Um, but if you're going to be launching um, on your own chain or one of these hubs, how do you communicate between chains and when does it make sense to do so? Well, as you can imagine, if you are launching your P2E game or your metaverse game or your music application, you are um, in your own ecosystem, your own container, which means that you might need to bring liquidity over. Now, you can go this on your own and use Interchain Messaging Bridge, bring it from Ethereum, or you can take advantage of the free transactions per second and scale and simply go over to Ruby Exchange that exists on the Exchange Hub. And when you do that, you would use the scale chain to scale chain bridge to be able to make that connection between your chain and that Exchange Hub. It's going to be extremely fast. Everything processes in 18 seconds or less, but what that means is that you're able to bring over the pairs that you need for your game, for your NFT, for anything that you're building, whether it's a stable coin, whether it's Ethereum, whether it's scale. <laughs> it could be any token that you want to use or any custom token that you want to use. So the normal flow is going to be bringing the liquidity that already exists in the scale ecosystem over to your chain, but there are some edge cases there. And one of those edge cases is if you're creating your own custom token on your own chain and you want that listed on the exchange, you have the same flexibility to use that same scale chain to scale chain transfer to push your token to the exchange that way it's listed for anyone else in the ecosystem to pull down later. So a really cool way of um, you know, spider webbing this together in a really organized way. And um, yeah, the scale chain to scale chain um, upgrade that's happening this week, actually, uh, you'll be able to start um, playing around with that relatively soon. And can I store like in-depth file storage? Can I store my files in another chain and use one uh, for bulk uh, data? Okay, so the next question is, um, for file storage, can I store my file storage, um, my files, my files in another chain and use another blockchain for the data of the application. Is that correct? Um, the answer to that is yes. I think one of the things that um, you know the community realized immediately when Skell said that we were going to launch this multi-chain architecture is, oh, I can have five chains for my application and then use them for different modules within my application. And that was a really cool way of thinking about it. Um, and so, yes, if you wanted to use one chain for launching your token or running your game or running your application, you can do that. But let's say that you wanted to store all of the files that were going to um, be accessed for being used within the game or used on your website or used for machine learning or used for any application, you'd be able to have another chain that runs side by side to that. And so what's really great is that it means that you can scale horizontally. You're able to start with one chain, and as you need more space, you can either upgrade from you know, a medium chain to a large chain because we offer different types, or you can say, hey, you know what? I simply just want a new chain altogether, so that way I can double my storage all at once and maintain the same transactions per second because I might not need more. 200 is enough. <laughs> Especially when you think that 200 for one application versus 200 for 500 applications, as you might see in some other networks, that's a different conversation. When you are um, on a dedicated chain and you have all of your services just for you, um, you can think about you know, using those services and not worrying about um, the fluctuations that anyone else might cause. So, yeah, you're welcome. Any other questions? The the IMA bridge, are all the chains sharing one IMA bridge over to the mainnet, or are they, do they have their own? Yeah. So with the IMA bridge, um, because each scale chain um, is its own environment, they all have their um, own like uh, smart contracts there, right? And so they connect to the smart contracts um, between Ethereum and scale. But yes, like the buckets that um, you would um, transact with on the scale chain side are all going to be your own. 
on the Ethereum side, it is going to um, be a shared environment, but that is um, really well um, separated, if you will, based off of the chain that you're interacting with. And so as you can imagine, that design was put into place to make it easier for scale chain to scale chain transfer. <laughs> and um, also Ethereum to um, scale transfer. But um, yes, essentially on the scale chain, um, you have your own bucket, your own um, smart contracts. And what's great is that you don't have to think about deploying these. Everything comes pre-deployed, pre-compiled. And so as you can imagine, what that means is an easier way to understand how to connect this on each and every scale chain. If the contract address is going to always be the same on all the scale chains, you don't have to think about keeping a mapping of that, which I, I think is a great way of uh, approaching creating the entertainment messaging protocol. So good job, engineering team, who's not here, but here in spirit, and we're really excited. So any other questions? All right. Well, with that, I'm going to conclude the session. But if you have any questions, definitely come see us at the booth. Uh, we'll be around um, tonight and tomorrow. Tomorrow, there's a special event. I can't tell you what the special event is, but come see Ryan. He will definitely explain that to you. It's going to be great. Um, but definitely come hang out with us and learn more about how to deploy your application onto scale. And before I go, I will just show this last screen here. For those, again, um, watching this virtually, definitely go ahead and scan that QR code or simply just put this um, URL in your browser. Again, we have 16,000 in prizes to be won, so definitely hack with us. Because at the very least, if you simply deploy, you have um, the possibility of winning that 4K prize that will be distributed among all teams. So at least give it a try. All right, thank you.
Cool. Oh, okay. We good? All right, we're good. We're good. All right. Um, this is uh, deployed optimism, 0 0.5 seconds of your money back. Um, the first like five minutes of this talk are going to be me talking about how to deploy it. And the second 40 minutes of this talk are going to be talking about optimism in general, trying to answer like architectural questions about uh, what's going on under the hood. So this should be pretty quick um, because it's very, very easy. So um, if you were working on optimism maybe about a year ago, you would have known that uh, optimism used to be really annoying to, to deploy to because we had this custom compiler and it was a total nightmare uh, and it made people really annoyed. So we got rid of it and I'll talk a little bit about how we got rid of it. But um, for now, the reality is that it's really, really easy to deploy. So anything that runs on Ethereum should run on optimism. One to one, the gas is all the same, the contracts are the same, it runs the same bytecode, you can use Solidity, Viper, whatever you want, works really, really well. And we spent a lot of time trying to make that happen. Um, so deploying with Remix, uh, it's very, very simple. First, you gotta add your uh, network, the Optimism network to your, to your wallet. So I made this website called chainid.link, and you just do, you go to this link, chainid.link, question mark, network equals optimism, and hit connect. Oh, and of course I probably have signed, oh, no, no, there we go. Oh, it's because I'm already connected, so. Whatever, I'll sign up to something. There we go, okay, right, boom, connect to my, uh, to Optimism. Uh, and I'm connected to, or I guess I, uh, this should be, this should be Optimism, whatever. Cool, all right, so you, you know, you do this with whatever wallet you have, connect, uh, connect to Optimism. And then, you know, go to, go to Remix and uh, write your contract. And I have a simple contract here that doesn't do anything. It doesn't matter, this is simple, but can be as complex as you want. You know, save it. Uh, connect MetaMask to, whoops, to your injected Web3 provider, and that's it. Just deploy, and um, this is what is this? Oh, this is on mainnet. So there you go, deploying on mainnet. That's it. That's easy. It's the same thing. It's really simple. It's just like deploying onto Ethereum, except it's faster and cheaper. Um, Okay, we go back to this. Uh, doing it, so with Remix, pretty straightforward. Uh, hard Hat, also very straightforward. Same general concept, just add Optimism to your network config and deploy. Um, I do have a very brief example of this. Straightforward, look at me. This is my network config. That's, that's all I added. I just added a, an Optimism network and then I can deploy my contracts. So I have my adder, same thing as before. I have my deploy function, same thing as before, and deploy. If it'll ever deploy, there we go, that was easy. Okay, that's it, it's the same thing. It's like that's, I, this is why this talk is really boring. It's just, it's just showing you how to deploy a contract. Um, same thing with Truffle. Literally just the same thing. You just add Optimism to your network config. I can maybe I can share the slides later if you want the link to this, but very straightforward. Same thing with Brownie, except you don't even need to add it to the network config because it's in there already. Um, and that's it. That's literally all it is. This is not a very in interesting talk, so I will talk about uh, the more interesting side of things, which is how Optimism uh, can actually be this easy to use which is as a result of this concept of EVM equivalence, um, which is sort of a, a stronger form of EVM compatibility where this trick is, you know, the EVM is a very delicate beast and uh, every time you change the EVM a little bit, you, you know, you can say that you're compatible because you're compatible with all, all the RPC endpoints, but if you change the behavior of the EVM, all of a sudden you get into sort of a weird, uh, weird state where you get developers who are relying on some very small feature of the EVM, and um, and you've told them that you're EVM compatible, but then this one feature of the EVM doesn't actually work. Uh, so, are you really EVM compatible? I would say no, but because so many people have said, "Oh, I'm EVM compatible," that we've come up with this new idea of EVM equivalence, where you're essentially just running an EVM 
that is like a production EVM that's being used to run the Ethereum mainnet. So it's the same exact virtual machine. Um, and you can actually like take this EVM and really run like a mainnet node with it. Um, in this case, we're using Geth's EVM to do this. So we literally, our client runs Geth. Okay, so um, yeah, so let's, let's sort of describe at a high level, why is this, okay. Let's describe at a high level um, how this whole system even functions, because it's quite interesting. You have your layer one, oops, there you go. You have your layer one, and your layer one is pretty, um, you know what that looks like, it's a blockchain, right? And then um, what we have is these two components. We have this thing called an op, the OP node, the op node, and it pulls transaction data from layer one, sort of just like pulls in layer one blocks. And from these layer one blocks, it deterministically generates a list of layer two blocks. Um, and then it takes these layer two blocks and it executes them. Like right at this point, you just have like a blockchain on layer two, and it's fully derived from layer one. So just like a pure function on layer one blocks that generates layer two blocks. And then you need to execute those blocks. So executing the blocks um, just happens in Geth. We take Geth, and uh, Geth has this very beautiful API called the Engine API, which is sort of a new thing for the merge. Um, but what it allows us to do is to treat Geth like a, like a thing that can be driven. There's the, you know, in, after, um, after the merge, you will no, no longer have this... Um, the, the, the execution and the consensus parts of Ethereum are being split into two pieces. So you have the part that executes blocks, and you have the part that figures out what those blocks should be. And we sort of realized, oh, well, we can actually apply the same exact idea to layer two. Why not? You get the blocks from layer one. That's the consensus. And you do the execution in this, this execution client. So in this case, the block execution literally just happens in Geth which gives you this like perfect EVM equivalence because you're not doing any sort of like weird translation into a different virtual machine. You're just running Geth. So everything just works how you would expect it to. Okay, first of all, before we do that, does anyone have questions? I don't want to like, I guess it's a workshop. It's kind of like a lecture. Um, all right, well, if people have questions, just stop me. We could do the whole microphone thing. Um, let me move this up. Okay. Okay, so um, this is, there we go, okay. So what, um, part of the safety of, like, of an optimistic roll-up is sort of the ability to prove, oh, let's, let's go a little, a little back. Essentially, um, if people aren't familiar with the idea of an optimistic roll-up, you're, you're publishing transaction data, you take transaction data from users, you sort of bundle it together and you publish it to layer one. And then you're, what you're also doing is you're executing these blocks and you're generating the results, right? You're, you're, um, when you execute a block, you get a, a resulting state root that says this is what the state of the system is. You get a bunch of sort of information about the state of the system. And we, we execute a bunch of blocks and then after a certain number of blocks, we take that sort of the state root of that block and some other information about it and we publish it to layer one. And the idea is that if we publish this data to layer one, then contracts on layer one can actually start to make decisions about what's going on with, on layer two. Uh, and you can use like Merkle proofs to basically prove something about the state of layer two given one of these sort of checkpoints. And it allows you to do, so deposits into a rollup are very, very easy. It's just a transaction on layer one. And this allows you to do withdrawals from a rollup because you can, um, you can do a proof that says, I can prove that you, let's say you burned this amount of money on layer two. I can prove that to you because I have a, a Merkle proof, but I can only do that if I have something to do a Merkle proof against, and that's what these checkpoints are. So we do these regular checkpoints that get published to layer one, and this gives something that contracts on layer one can execute a proof against so that they can make decisions about what happened on layer two. Uh, and this gives you deposits and withdrawals. So, but the question is, how do you actually guarantee that this thing that is being published to layer one, this, this state root or this output is, that's being published to layer one is actually correct? Because it could just be anything. I mean, the whole point of the optimistic rollup is that it's not, you are not performing the, the execution of transactions on layer one. So Ethereum has no clue if the execution result is correct. You're kind of just telling it, this is what the result was. But do, it doesn't have any proof of this. Um, 
So what we want to do is we, we have a program that we're running, and we want to prove that that program is ran correctly, right? We want to take a, this, now I'm getting these this sort of mathematical stuff, but it doesn't really matter that much. Um, we have a program, and we want to prove that the program ran correctly. Uh, that's, you know, that allows us to sh say, based on the transaction inputs that we've published to layer one, the output, the state root that we published to layer one is absolutely correct, and it can't be wrong. So how do you do this proof? Well, whatever, you have a program. Um, what does our program look like? Our program, it, it takes L1 blocks, it generates L2 blocks, then it executes those L2 blocks, and then it takes that, that finds that final state root from the last L2 block. It's a very simple program. Um, and then, you know, more generally, what is a program? Because it's important. Um, we have a machine architecture. It can be whatever we want. It can be like x86, or it can be something even simpler. Or it can be the EVM. And then we de define operations within that architecture. So essentially, we have opcodes, right? So the EVM has a bunch of opcodes. x86 has opcodes, blah, blah, blah. And it's a series of operations, right? Um, and this is universal. Like, this is sort of what a program fundamentally is. And what we're really trying to prove is something about a, a series of execution steps inside of this machine architecture, right? It could be the EVM. We're trying to prove this opcode happened, then this opcode happened, then this opcode happened, and I actually executed those opcodes correctly. So we have this series of, of steps. The EVM is fully deterministic, right? So given a starting state and the EVM, Everyone gets the same result. This is why this entire blockchain thing even works. And, um, and we want to prove that we ran, let's say, the EVM correctly. So we sort of want to prove this, the, 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 uh, the correctness of this trace of, just think about it, the list of execution steps. That's what I mean when I say a trace. Just the list of things that happened. Um, and except on Ethereum, we don't want to re-execute every single step because if we wanted to re-execute every single step, we'd be wasting a huge amount of gas, um, and it'd be really, really expensive, because the whole point of the optimistic rollup is to sort of not have to do all this, this work, and you really don't want this proof process to, to, to be executing an entire Ethereum transaction, because it's really hard and really expensive. Um, so yeah, so the question is, you know, how do you do something like this with the EVM, because it's a very complicated program, um, the answer is, well, either you go and you build an EVM interpreter in the EVM, which is a huge amount of effort and it's not worth it, uh, or you can just do something much, uh, much cleverer where you can take the, um, you take our, your program and you compile it into a much simpler machine. So our program here is Geth, which is sort of like a wrap, sl slight wrapper around the EVM. And then we have these little other parts that I talked about, you know, figuring out the L2 blocks and figuring out the final state root. You kind of think that, of that whole thing as your program, and what you're going to do is you're going to compile it. So you're going to compile it into a simpler architecture, right? Um, I mean, you, know, you, you, you can compile geth, right? This is a thing that people do, so you, you take your program, you compile it into a simple machine architecture. And if we want to get an execution trace out of this, we run our program. You know, it's a compiled binary. We run that with some input. And, um, and we run an emulator. And at every step, we sort of record what the state of the machine was. So we take, you know, what is the state of, the, of this virtual machine at step zero? OK, the memory is this. The program counter is this. The stack looks like this. You take that. You take a snapshot of it. And you do that process for every single execution step. So you can't, gener you can't really execute this whole thing on Ethereum. A single transaction generates a massive execution trace. So you could, I guess, do this proof by just, uh, just executing every single step on Ethereum and seeing what the result was. It should give you a result. It's a machine, a virtual machine. You can run it on Ethereum, just like you can run pretty much anything else on Ethereum. So you can run every single execution step on Ethereum, but it would take forever. It would be really, really, really expensive. So you don't want to do this. Um, you instead introduce this idea of bisection games, and this is sort of what Trubit, uh, Trubit really pioneered years ago. And getting into some more annoying mathy terms, but you don't need to know about it. 
the idea of the bisection game is that if you think about your program as a series of execution steps, then, uh, and, and you say that the starting step, step zero, is based on a known state. We all agree on step zero. But we disagree, and we agree on step zero because we must have, if, sort of, if you think about it from the optimistic roll-up standpoint, let's say that each one of the things corresponds to a block. If I'm challenging block N, and, I, and I, it's because I disagree with the result that was pub published for that block. But doing that is sort of an implicit statement that I agree with the result of block n minus 1. Because if I didn't agree with the result of block n minus 1, I would have challenged n minus 1 instead. So you can follow this logic backwards and backwards and backwards. And the idea is that you, you, are, you should be incentivized to always challenge the first thing that you disagree with. Because if you, you should just challenge the earliest thing. Because if you wipe... Whatever. The point is, you're going to challenge the earliest thing. And so we agree on the starting state, because the starting state is the output state of the previous block, which we agree on. So we agree on the starting state, but we obviously disagree on the, sort of the ending state of running this virtual machine, and we have to figure out which one of us is right. And if you, th if you sort of think about it, if we agree on the starting state, but we disagree on the ending state, then at some point in the middle, there must be some step where we agree on the previous step, but we disagree on the next one. That's just sort of, you know, I, I could prove it, but it's, it's sort of intuitive. At some point, you, you got to a point where you disagreed. So you want to find out how can you find this first execution step where you disagree? Because if you can just get down to executing a single execution step, that's very, very cheap, and you can do that on Ethereum no problem. So you want to figure out how you and your sort of your adversary can, you know, the person who published this result, this, this output, this claim about the state of layer two, how you two can sort of play a game and figure out where this first disagreement is. And the process that we do is we generate our execution traces and we generate a snapshot of this, of this machine state at every single execution step. And then we turn that trace, sort of, or we, we hash that, that snapshot and then we generate a Merkle tree out of it. So if you think about the machine starts here and then the machine goes into, into its next state. And remember, this is all deterministic, right? The machine just operates on a state, and it produces some output state. So you go from step one to step two to step three. And you t at each point, you're taking a snapshot, and you're hashing it. And then you generate this big Merkle tree out of this, this array of machine states. And so then you want to try to find you and your, your sort of, your, like I said, your adversary are trying to find the first step that you conflict on. And so what you do is you look at, you, you start making your way down the Merkle tree, and you look at each root and you say, do I, disagree, do I agree with this root, this intermediate node of the Merkle tree or not? At this point, let's say we've gone down the Merkle tree and we say, okay, we disagree on both sides. Remember, this is in order of the execution. So this means we disagree on the second half of execution and we disagree on the first half of execution, somewhere in the first half. So we always want to find the earliest step, so we're going to start thinking about the, the first half of the execution. And let's say, okay, we agree, we sort of go down here, and we agree on the first two steps. Right? We agree on this route, but we disagree on this route. And so if we agree on this route, that means we agree on these two execution steps. We agree here, we agree here, because we both have the same thing in our little Merkle trees that we're comparing. But we disagree here. So now the question is, do we disagree here because this is different, or do we disagree here because this is different, because they're both part of this, this intermediate node? And then maybe, you know, as an example, you say, okay, we disagree because this is different, but we actually agree on the contents of this. Um, so by doing this game, we just go back and forth, and we compare our trees, and we try to find the first node in the Merkle tree where, uh, where the hash is different. And that first node in the Merkle tree where the hash is different represents, or the first leaf node in the Merkle tree, represents the first execution step where you agreed on the previous step, uh, but you disagreed on the next one. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to execute this step, because you're saying that the result of this step was x, and I'm saying the result of this step was y, and we're going to figure out which one of us is right, and we're going to do that by executing this machine step on, uh, on Ethereum. Um, so how do we do this? It's pretty interesting. We literally just built uh, a machine interpreter in Solidity. So there's a, we, picked, we deliberately picked a very simple 
uh, simple virtual machine called, or just simple machine architecture called MIPS. Um, and it's about 400 lines of actual Solidity code. So you can actually see like a, like a VM interpreter on chain for, for very little code, uh, which is really cool. So just to reiterate the full, full challenge process in a nutshell, someone publishes a proposed version of the L2 state. This takes the form of a hash. Then somebody else comes in and challenges that state. And then the proposer and the challenger play this game where they go back and forth and try to find the first step where they disagree. And so you find that step. So one of them now executes that machine step on chain, literally just like a virtual machine instruction on chain. And this is, you know, it's just a program, like a machine architecture is just a program itself uh, that takes instructions and generates some output. Um, so you execute it. Then Ethereum knows who's correct because they've cause Ethereum's the one doing the execution, so it knows who wins. And if the challenger wins, then the state proposal is invalidated. And so this means that somebody else has to come in and say, actually, this was the correct result of executing that uh, block on layer two or whatever it is. And then, um, oh well, uh, whatever. So optimistic rollups are a solved problem. I think this is actually very true. They're complicated, but not really in a lot of ways. They're very, it's sort of, a, you know, that architecture that we were describing is actually very, very straightforward. And, and the, the, actual, the changes that we made to Geth are like less than 400 lines of code total. Um, and I could have gone on for way, way longer, but I won't. So let's, we can go to questions. If people have any questions about optimism, how it works, any of these little, there's sort of a lot of jargon in here, but whatever. I mean, yes, do we have a little, an extra mic? Okay. Yeah, thank you for the talk so far. Um, my beginner question I would say would be like, what's the benefit for me to deploy to optimism versus Ethereum mainnet? Uh, yeah. It's sure, yeah. Cool. So, um, the primary benefit is just that you're going to get essentially the same exact experience as on mainnet, except it's going to be way, way, way cheaper. And, and we could do this by kind of separating the execution. Like mainnet, you have thousands and thousands of nodes that are executing all these things. Optimism, it's just the people who care about optimism. There's just like a lot less people on the network, so it's just cheaper in general. Um, but yeah, so it's cheaper. We've added some interesting stuff to make it also faster, which is sort of these interesting things you can do when you, when you are a layer two. You can uh, introduce this idea of a sort of sequencer, which is a block producer. And the block producer can give you really, really, really fast, pretty reliable confirmations. And so you get sort of a much snappier experience. You get to see what your transaction did within like a second or two instead of waiting 15 seconds. Um, and, you know, when constructed correctly, these things basically give you the same security guarantees as Ethereum with basically one added security assumption, which is that there's a single honest participant uh, watching the chain and willing to perform the challenge process if necessary. Um, so you get basically all the benefits of Ethereum with a, with a single honest party assumption. So you're not trusting like a majority of some set of validators. It's just like one person on the network is incentivized properly to do this. And um, yeah, and it's cheaper and faster. So. And you also pay with ETH uh, and gas? Or? Yeah, yeah, you also okay. pay in ETH with gas. So you can, yeah. Thank you. Of course. Other questions? Or let's uh, we'll pass the. Um, I I think we read up somewhere online that one of the sort of subtle differences between deploying on Ethereum mainnet and deploying on Optimism is that the it says something about being careful about using uh, block times for timings in your contracts. Mm -hmm. Could you maybe just allude to where that comes from? Why the block time is not consistent in Optimism? Sure, yeah. So um, this basically comes from this like this block producer that we call the sequencer. And it's just that you can't make um, the, the assumptions around the sort of the, the what's the word? Um, like the fidelity of the timestamp are a little weaker than on Ethereum. And it's, it's because the, the sequencer has a little bit of room 
Um, you have to give them a little bit of room in, in when they can create their blocks. And so this, technically the sequencer within certain bounds can manipulate the timestamp. It always has to be going up and it always has to be basically within a certain, a certain window of the current like actual Ethereum time. Um, but there's leeway for them to, to go like a minute into the future or something like that, right? So, so you can't, you can trust it for, for many things if you're just trying to keep time over the course of, let's say, days or even hours, sort of longer periods of time where that like minute or two minute fidelity doesn't really matter that much. But if you expect time to work within very, very tight periods of time, it, you sort of have to trust that the sequencer isn't going to try to use that to explicitly mess with your contracts. It's just something you need to be careful with. If that makes sense. Yeah, sure. Okay. Um, how does optimism compare to ZK rollups in terms of like security assumptions and also like speed, like now and also in the future, I guess? Um, this is a good question. The, I mean, at the moment, op optimistic rollups are like functional. I'll say um, they're, they're they're way more reliable. I mean, maybe except for like Starknet, which is still still in in alpha. Um, I guess one of the main selling points at the moment is that they're they're very functional. Uh, you have you know you have different assumptions about the the safety, but like really it all boils down to whether you want to whether you want to make a, a like the one honest party assumption or whether you want no assumption at all. Uh, and the one real downside long term of the optimistic world is just that you have this, basically you need to give people enough time to be able to actually challenge these state proposals. And so you need a window of time that we call the challenge period where somebody can come in and, and challenge something. Um, this, both of these things, I mean, the realistic thing is that optimistic rollups are still a thousand times easier to build. And so there's, there's sort of like the other side of the security argument, which is like, how secure is it if there's like two people in the world that can really audit it? At what point is it, you know, the more complexity you introduce into your system, the more you're opening yourself up to bugs. It's just sort of like security ends up being this spectrum. And, and we actually think in a lot of ways, optimistic rollups end up being more secure, at least now. Um, in the long term, like, I don't know, very long term, for me, five plus years, you might see ZK rollups. I, I, I actually think that the, the way to build these systems correctly in the future is to do, a, um, to do an optimistic rollup. And then when these state results are published, these tech points are published, immediately start generating a ZK proof between the last two checkpoints that have been published. And so, you, so in the worst case, you get this optimistic rollup. If no one's publishing these these validity proofs, it's an optimistic rollup. But when people are publishing the validity proofs, you can actually, you know, the validity proofs, proofs you you don't even need to think about waiting the seven day period. As soon as that validity proof is up, you're you're able to withdraw. So now it just becomes a problem of optimizing your um, prover, so you can get very very fast proving times, and um, and you can just publish these validity proofs very quickly, and so you cut down on your, um, on your withdrawal time to be just the length of the, the proving time. So I, I think realistically that the future is probably going to be like a hybrid optimistic ZK thing, and luckily optimism isn't designed in a way, so you can slap this on the current system and it doesn't, you don't have to change anything. So I just think it's like overly complicated is my answer for ZK. Yeah. Cool. Other questions? Comments, concerns, opinions? I think we got like, I don't know, 15 more minutes or if people are tired, we can just, just go to bed. <laughs> All right. I think we're just gonna call it. We can just do uh, questions afterwards if, if people have them. Cool.